And so no fail is just kind of bringing it back to like, hey man, what were you taught when you learned how to ride a bike? Having a flyer go off somewhere else is almost as serious as a push shot for it. Well, I think because I mean, the original weapon lights that were issued were like, what, 60 meters or something like yep. that? Yeah. Hey everyone, Matt Lanford here with Primary and Secondary. Welcome to Modcast. Today is January 16th, 2021, and it is episode 255. It's an open mic. So no idea what we're going to discuss, no idea who the panel is, but I suspect we have a bunch of guys that want to jump in and talk about whatever. Um, right now it's interesting what's going on on Facebook. Seems a, a bunch of pages, groups, and people have kind of either they've lost They've lost their identity. They've lost their administrative rights. They've lost their ability to post. They've lost their ability to create groups. Some groups have disappeared. It's kind of scary. Some of the things I've read is the possibility that it's uh, attached to the upcoming uh, inauguration. Whether it is or not, I have no idea. Seeing some of these groups, though, and some of these pages disappear tells me it's more than that. So with that in mind, if you have some kind of a social media group or an entity or something on Facebook, reach out to me at matt at primaryandsecondary.com and I bet I can put together a corner of our forum just for you. Um, basically what I'm doing is I, I've, I, I've set up some, uh, some areas, some sub forums on our forum at primaryandsecondary.com slash forum where people can essentially maintain what they were doing already but not be worried about being censored, not be worried about having things deleted, not worry about any of that crap that Facebook is currently doing to people that are, well, they're not breaking any laws. They're, they're discussing firearms. And also on our forum, you, we can sell and buy guns and crap. So it's, uh, it's nice to be able to maintain this kind of a backup and this kind of a community because the goal is to maintain the communities that we have. And if we lose access to Facebook, there's a good possibility a lot of people might get lost and might not be able to reconnect with this awesome community that we have. So please reach out to me. I'm happy to help. Anything I can do to help uh, retain your community, um, I, I have the resources av available to you for your use. So before we officially start, big thanks to Philster Holsters. Um, let's see here, the Pro Series. If you're running, a pistol without a weapon light, red dot or not, and you're an appendix kind of person. Let's say you're using a, oh, I don't know, I got a SIG 320 right here. If you're doing a 320 or some form of a Glock or all kinds of other different guns, the SIG Pro Series is actually really, really nice. Um, when it was initially released, a lot of people looked at it and saw these bulbous portions of it and thought, how the hell is this going to be comfortable? It is. It's very comfortable. It's very effective. Um, that is the Pro Series from Filster. Also, big thank you from, or big thank you to Staccato. So I've been carrying 2011s now on duty and as part of my everyday carry. Um, how long? I don't know how long it's been. Um, I, I, I ended up picking up a Staccato. As a matter of fact, at the time it was an STI. And I picked up this STI to get ready to get to know these better. And I was really impressed. It was an awesome shooting gun. Um, then Staccato changed gears from STI. Yeah, they went from STI to Staccato. I picked up one of their uh, P duos just before the name change. And I was impressed. Uh, optic ready, full size duty pistol, double stack 1911 essentially. Awesome shooter. Absolutely love shooting it. Great pistol. Uh, they come in various sizes. Um, oh, if, yeah, if you, if you want to compact something a little closer to a Glock 19, they have the C2s. Uh, the P2, or the, uh, I, I'm running the uh, um, P Duo, which they changed the name, which I need to write that one down. But the P Duo is basically your, your typical um, duty carry, uh, full size pistol. And then there is a Compt XC, which is awesome. I got to shoot one at our training event. So check them out. Speaking of checking things out, somehow Walther is one of those brands that people haven't really paid attention to. I know a couple years ago, I wasn't paying attention to them. And then some friends like Steve Fisher and Jim, Jim Dexter said, I should probably kind of look, take a look at them, check out the PPQ. And I looked at the PPQ. 
and I was impressed. It is a awesome, awesome pistol. Um, the Q series, the uh, Q4, Q5, the steel frames, awesome, awesome pistols. Now, unfortunately, we have, uh, there's kind of a shortage in firearms, and it's difficult to find things, and things are expensive right now. That means you need to make your purchases count. If you can find a PPQ, if you haven't messed with one, dry fire it a bit. I suspect you'll like it very much. As far as the striker fired pistol is concerned, the Walthers have the best triggers. Uh, factory, awesome. So lastly, big thank you to our Patreon subscribers. Without the Patreon subscribers, we wouldn't have these awesome resources like the forum that is turning out to be kind of a, uh, uh, it's a refugee camp for all these people that have left Facebook. Um, thank you to the Patreon subscribers. If you want to help support, uh, go to patreon.com slash primary and secondary. Uh, there are various levels. There are various benefits with each level. One of these benefits, especially on the higher tier, there is a, uh, this, there's a considerable discount to our upcoming training event in September. The uh, Primary and Secondary Training Summit is September 4th, 5th, and 6th. We have the same cast of instructors and then a couple additional ones. I'm really excited about this. Last year was fantastic. Um, it was wonderful to see, to see old friends, for everyone to come together. Um, as Jared Reston said, the, the, the fellowship is wonderful. Now, for people that are new to primary and secondary that, that came in, they were, they were accepted with open arms and everyone left better trained with wonderful attitudes and very happy. So um, that is actually, registration for that is uh, currently open just for Patreon subscribers of, I don't remember which level, but yeah, uh, I'll be opening up to the public soon. Right now I'm compiling the schedule. Uh, if you go to primaryandsecondary.com, look at the left-hand side of the menu on the, on the top. And it says the it talks about the event, and I'm slowly working on that schedule, and you can watch it real time because I don't think it needs to be hidden. So, so let's see here. I think that's pretty much it. Before I before we we go into the show, just make sure make sure you like, make sure you subscribe, make sure you follow, make sure you're sharing, um, make sure you subscribe, make sure you uh, support. That's the word I'm looking for. Make sure you support those sources that you have found to be beneficial. Primary and secondary is comprised of some absolute wonderful people who do wonderful things for this community and for the public. And these people need your support as well as I do. I, I need likes, I need shares, I need subscriptions. But these guys do too. So if you like what Varg says, make sure you find them on social media, give them likes and shares. Uh, subscriptions are, are it's, it's all currency, unfortunately. So. Um, yeah, make sure you're doing that. We, we definitely appreciate that. And I think from here, we'll start the show. Now, whether Jack was actually intending on being on the panel, I don't know. I wonder if that's... How's it going? Good. I wonder if this is our Andrew Fisher or some imposter. <laughs> I think we're about to find out. It's me. It's, hey, I know that voice. Hey. What's up? Oh, nothing. We're going to be doing an open mic. I saw that, and I'm bored on a Saturday, so. Perfect. I'm going to so, uh, study in for the ab site and uh, try to, to interact with people. And you're going to interact with a lot of people. At least you're going to be able to address them. Yes. So I just oh, went terrible. and or last week I went and bought uh, the PD. Let's see here. What did I buy them? I bought them a bunch of TQs, a bunch of tourniquets. Sure, the, the, the department can buy it, but why waste the funds when I can just say, hey, you know what? This is a donation from primary and secondary to uh, the PD. And it's, it's just nice. It's nice to be able to yeah. do that. Uh, I've done that for other agencies. Um, Got some, uh, what else did I get? Some chest seals and I forgot what else. But yeah, it's it's just nice to yeah provide that stuff. I did weapon lights a couple years ago. Dude, I need to get on your list of yeah. donations. Well, it's for rifles to have a rifle and not a weapon light, especially in a police role. I think that's kind of scary. Yeah. I can't imagine. Uh, I certainly probably 
don't have enough for my personal stuff, but I can't imagine being deployed and not have a light on my yeah. weapon. Yeah. yeah. What kind of tourniquets did you get them? Uh, the Cat 7. All from North American. North American. Yeah, th those guys. Solid. That's, yeah. that's good. Yeah. I have that. Sp I have a special account with them. So I just. Yeah, there is, I, I found, you know, every, you know, all the recommended tourniquet. Big distributors have, have pretty good uh, discounts for professionals. Yeah. 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 And I didn't want to get anything different from what we already had because that would just confuse people. Uh -huh. So yeah. we're just sticking with what we have. Absolutely. So have you guys been seeing all the crap with uh, Facebook? Term not terminating, but they're limiting people's access to their administrative abilities or closing up groups or anything like that. Yeah, so Philster is uh got screwed. I'm actually so I was uh, actually logged back into the forum for the first time in probably a year or two. Well, good. Well, we I, well, I mean, if that's what we're going to do, we're going to go back to going back to websites with forums. That's that's fine. Yeah. Jack, how about you? Have you seen anything that no one else has reported on? No, I just saw Philster, and then I'm I'm pretty sure that yeah, I'm sure it's out there. I'm sure it's happening. Um, you know, I like to follow Tim Pohl a lot, and he's you know he talks about just on YouTube his videos getting taken down, and uh, like you said, it just just like you said, it's like okay, so people go back to websites with their own forums on there that uh, people go back to mail order uh getting a, a monthly periodical yeah that's <laughs> in right. the mail you know um mike it sends a liberty lost all of his administrative ability on his i, I don't know if it's both his group or his page i know several people can't even post in groups um yeah there are a couple there are a couple it's just kind of it's 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 strange too supposedly it's because of the inauguration who knows? Yeah. I think there's a lot of that with, with I, if you think that any of these big tech companies, other than just being able to have power or tell you what to do to make money, really give a shit about any of these issues. I, I don't think they do. I just think a lot of it is just kind of a appeasement, uh, appeasement or like a pre, you know, just like, Hey, just like you would stock the shelves with eggnog before Christmas if you're Walmart. I think just with them as a money move, they're worried about whatever backlash or whatever perception and, and they're going to do what they want to do to continue to make money. I'm not sure if it's completely evil overlord uh, left this to Ginger, but I'm sure it's in there. You know, they, they, it's, you know, they got a lot of folks in there that have that. I'm sure that informs their decisions, but um, it doesn't mean I agree with it. I'm not, I'm not saying it's the right answer. It's just an answer. You know? Yeah. It is an, an answer. Um, man, that reminds me, I, I didn't have any eggnog over the season. That's, that's not right. Neither did I. I'm, I'm a little disappointed in myself because who doesn't have eggnog? We got one thing of eggnog and it took forever to go through because uh, it was like the first time in my adult life I ever like looked at the ingredients of it and I saw the amount of sugar per serving and how little like like what a serving of eggnog is and I want to say it's something like two teaspoons it's something not a lot it's, it's make you feel bad right yeah, it makes you feel bad bad. Like, Ooh, shit. Um, it's, as, as soon as as soon as I read the sugar content, my knees became inflamed. I was like, "Oh God!" I was like, <laughs> I was like "Oh shit!" Oh, you're getting the sugar. <laughs> and then you know, you know, it's like you get, you know, like my daughter's almost three, so it's just like anything that I can do to not exacerbate her being three. You know, like I obviously don't want to stifle her, but man, it, there's a, so much stuff where I think about when I was a kid, how much sugar and bullshit I was allowed to eat. And, uh, cause people didn't know any better. And I'm just like, man, I don't, 
wonder why your kids kind of, why we think this kid's got ADHD. It's like, maybe because we got him jacked up on Mountain Dew. That's probably why. Yeah. I, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> You know, dude, uh, seriously, like I, I get banged out of my mind probably every day between, but it's, it's gotta be, I, and that's another one. It's like you accidentally pick up one that's got like sugar in it and you look at that and you're like, how many grams? 65. What the shit? <laughs> yeah. I can hear I, the I sugar. Drink, uh, yeah. <laughs> I drink uh, uh, drinks and, and things with sugar on just so I'm aware. Right. Like I stay away from the sugar free stuff just so I know what I'm getting myself into. It's not good or bad. I don't know if it limits anything at all. I just, at least I, I, I'm more aware that I'm drinking sugar. That's, that was like the thing. I think it was at one point it was because people talk about diets or fitness. Because I mean, you know, in general, I mean, you're a COVID, you know, they're talking about all the people with, uh, uh, comorbidities and, and pre-existing, you know, health issues. And uh, at one point I was working the ER in the hospital and it was just, I was talking to one of the guys, he said, you know, there's so many people that don't know what their underlying conditions are. They don't know that they have stuff going on. They just deal with it. And I remember with just as far as diet went, just even trying to eliminate sugar. Cause there's so much stuff that it, there's so much shit where it's just like, you can pick whatever diet you want. You can pick whatever workout modality you want. And it just seems like across the board, if you just try to limit your sugar, you're going to be okay. That seems like, you know, just read a label and be like, oh, okay, well, I, I'm not going to get that. And then, you know, go on. And, yeah. Uh, I think, I think it's, it's yeah, everything in moderate. Right. It's gonna be. right. I keep on watching the, uh, I think it's just one of those ones where like nobody, I think people thought they were moderating it. They just didn't know. Yeah. Yeah, I believe, I believe so. And, and honestly, our, our COVID numbers are so bad because America is morbidly obese and they, a third of the people probably have diabetes. The sugar. It's the, yeah. it's the I, I had it. I had a friend. Yeah. I had a friend dropped a hundred pounds and it's, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. He stopped being diabetic all of a sudden and he stopped taking blood pressure, blood pressure medication and whatever he had going on with his heart cleared up. It's, yeah. it's crazy. You drop a hundred extra pounds, how that shit clears up, you know? So, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. You, know, you know, uh, I, so working in, uh, being a surgery resident uh, and working in uh, like bariatric surgery, it's amazing. Once people get to a certain point, uh, it becomes almost impossible for them to keep weight off. Uh, and there's something about their physiology changes to where it's, there's nothing that they can do. You do get great stories about people losing losing 100 pounds and, and, and their diabetes going away and, and they become healthy. Um, that's, that's pretty rare for that to happen. And really the, the, you know, the only real cure probably is, is like a gastric bypass surgery. So I, I, I think it's ultimately your friend lost that much weight and was able to become healthy again. Yeah. I think there's stuff too, where it's like, I've always kind of felt that way. Like what you said, that there becomes like a change in somebody's body. It was felt when somebody becomes that obese. It, it there's something beyond like you know what we always tell people where they have low willpower they have this they're mm -hmm. weak or whatever it's like i think there's like an actual mutation that occurs to your body once you become like that it's fat it, like yeah there's something that changes. i don't have any science behind that this is the way i've always felt about it yeah the, no there's something that that definitely yeah. changes Which i don't is, know if they've been able to identify some you know the boom it's right there but uh, yeah, I mean, you talk to the people who do this for a living, uh, these gastric bypass surgeons, and they're like, there's something, the same changes, and uh, they are, they cannot lose the weight. Even if they lose the weight, uh, they eventually gain it back. It's, it's kind of sad, and, and wow. it's changing my outlook on the way I look at like morbidly obese people. And now I'm like, let's get them some surgery. 
So speaking of medical type mm -hmm. things, one thing I really want to discuss, not only tourniquets, because I think we should have a quick discussion about tourniquets, because that's important, but also what about the hemostatics? What about the hemostatics? The proper application and the improper application, because people buy them for their kits, but I don't know if they've read, actually read, because no one's going to read it, but if they, if they listen to it, they might actually, might go in one ear and stay there. Um, I, I'll, I'll say that there's no evidence that hemostatics have a survival benefit. Hmm. So you can use hemostatics all you want, but if they're overall, when it comes to outcomes, it is not saying, hey, we're saving a life because you use hemostatics. Yeah. So I'm not saying it doesn't control hemorrhage. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just saying that overall, when we look at you, you put the pressure dressing in or you pack the wound and then you go show up to the ER and maybe, maybe not, we take them to surgery. Uh, overall, it's not saving a life. Hmm. And also a proper application. Yeah. Because I, I understand some people seem to think, well, I, I, if, I, if I'm shot in the gut, I put in this. And my understanding is that's not the best option. Say that one more time. So shot anywhere on the torso. Yeah. Uh, apply it there. My understanding is it has the potential of damaging any organs it may come in contact with. I'm not, no, that's not true. Okay. Oh, let's, let's talk about that then. I, I don't Perfect. know what to talk about. It doesn't, it doesn't injure any organs. I've okay. heard of people saying that if you pack a wound that you're going to injure structures underneath, but I, I don't see how that's possible. Oh, I mean the, uh, the stuff that's drawing all the moisture. Oh, no, 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 okay. no, no, cool. you can, no, we, they, they pack wounds all the time with, uh, without any sort of repercussions. Mm -hmm. I think what's the most important is to identify where the bleeding is located and then putting whatever it is, either compressed gauze or gauze or a hemostatic dressing onto the, where the bleeding is and then pack around it, creating that pressure and that's what's going to control the hemorrhage versus yeah. just kind of putting it on top or, or what, you know, whatever you're concerned about that it may be damaging. You now there's, I'm not aware of any adverse events that are associated with the actual dressing itself outside of the old, you know, granules that you kind of poured in, yeah. but, but that's not around anymore. I mean, you do have the, there are some, you know, devices like the RevMedX that has the, yeah, the syringe um, thing. sponges that you can push in. And I know that there's some other, I think, uh, Cellox has some granules now. I don't use the granules. I use, I pack, you know, the, the RevMedX sponges myself. So we'll, we'll see how it's turned out, but I don't cool. think there's any sort of adverse events that are going to be associated with it. Cool. Well, that right there just, uh, resol or resolved, dissolved, something, a myth. Yes. Yes. Crushed, destroyed. It destroyed a myth. So tourniquets. You're going to lose listeners. That's right okay. Now. Cause we're, cause, cause we're also waiting for more guys so they can chime in and make fun of us. Yeah. So tourniquets, what, what are the, what are the, the go-tos right now? Obviously the cat seven. Uh, there are, uh, eight recommended tourniquets Eight now. Um, yes. Um, so there are eight recommended tourniquets, uh, on the market, uh, non pneumatic tourniquets are recommended from the committee on type of combat casualty care. Uh, it is the cat, uh, gen six cat gen seven, the ratcheting medical tourniquet or the RMT, the SAM extremity tourniquet or the SAM XT the soft tactical tourniquet wide gen three. So the soft T gen three, the tactical mechanical tourniquet or TMT and the TX two or the TX three tourniquet. And that's made, made by rev med X. Yeah. That's yeah. Well, I, that those recommendations came out in 2019 and it was an exhaustive process. It took about a year to come to that conclusion. Yeah. And so some of the dangers of, not using something on that list would be failures or damage or if you yeah, accidentally put it on your yeah, neck. <laughs> you know, that if, if you look at the other tourniquets on there that did not make the recommendation list, there's clearly studies that demonstrate that they do work. Um, it's about the, you know, 
reproducibility uh, and about, you know, how effective are they in certain hemorrhage? Yeah. You know, I can, I can talk about the tourniquet that we all think about. Um, but you know, I don't, I don't think that that's necessarily important. I honestly, if you look at the, look at the, uh, look at the uh, SWAT T, mm -hmm. right? The SWAT T is pretty effective for a lot of hemorrhage. Uh, it's just not great for the military in the care under fire situation. So if, if you are a civilian carrying a, carrying a tourniquet and you want to carry something that may be more compact and fits into your pocket and you're not expecting to be in a care under fire situation, then maybe the SWAT T is the right tourniquet for you. I, you know, the, at the end of the day, they're, they're just recommendations and yep. you have to choose what is right for you. And I'm not going to tell someone that, you know, uh, the SWAT T or the rats or something like that isn't or doesn't work. I'm just going to simply say that for the military's perspective that, you know, that's, that's what we recommend. Yeah. Now there's a question here asking about uh, tourniquets for kids or smaller <clears throat> folk. Uh, the majority of the tourniquets on the list, uh, on the recommended list, do work on pediatric patients, including the, the, the RMT definitely works, right? It's a rasherdine type tourniquet. So the RMT, the TX2, TX3, uh, but also the CAT um, definitely works. Uh, I've, I've talked to the folks at Combat Medical and TMT, and I kind of wonder about their ability for that tourniquet to work because it's, it's a much wider tourniquet. It's a two inch tourniquet and kind of the, the stabilization plate is kind of curved already. So I wonder about its ability to kind of clamp down on a smaller, uh, on a smaller uh, limb. I remember you saying also that direct pressure. Oh yeah. I mean, that, that's the way kind of like the, when we look at the SWAT T is it works a lot of the works well, the pressure dressing. So yeah, I mean, if it's small children that uh, is too small for you to apply a regular windless type tourniquet, then certainly the a tourniquet that that uh, like a, a elastic tourniquet, uh, rats or SWAT T will work, or generally just an elastic pressure dressing will work. Where do Israeli dressings fall into modern <sighs> medical? I'm not a huge fan of them, man. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, man. Don't. They're don't use your belt. They're over <laughs> and it's nothing against people who make it. I just don't. It's like it's like got one purpose, and it's got that weird sort of pressure thing. I don't even know what to call it. I can't remember the name of it, but I just I can buy elastic dressing and do the same darn thing, right? I can take it and I can just create pressure based upon my ability to pull and create the tension and, and allow the elastic dressing to do its job. I'm not sure that really gives you any sort of advantage. Aha, it's the Israeli maxi pad, as Kyle yeah. has pointed out. Nice. Well, I mean, it's, I, was, I was talking to somebody the other day, just, just us having a conversation about dressing and tourniquets and uh, packing and, and, and everything. and. I don't know, maybe it was a long time ago now. I mean, I, I just remember that was just more of the advanced conversation where now, like, this is a simple, like, entry conversation. Like, people were like, hey, we need you to know this. Like, this is, like, stuff we need you to get up to speed on. Whereas, like, uh, yeah, I remember just getting out of boot camp just for years. It was put your ID card on a second chest one and, you know, use your belt for a tourniquet and all that other, you know, stuff where it's just, I'm glad that we've become as far as we have with it, you know, and it's like out into the, it's out into the, um, it's not just medics talking to each other. It's not just doctors talking to each other. I'm glad that this is becoming more of a knowledgeable thing. Yeah. You know, where it has been, um, but you know, like you said, you, you get some of the dumb shit where you got guys still trying to talk about shoving tampons and fucking wounds, but you know, like, you know, I guess hopefully that works out for them, I guess. But I, I'm just, it's, it's just interesting to me, just like you, definitely from 20 years ago to 15 years ago to 10 to five, just to see where the conversations are and see where everybody is with it. 
and then just like the general overall knowledge, like the what we consider basic knowledge used to be the advanced class. You know, well, I think we got all sorts of great right. opportunities now for you to learn, uh, even in this sort of environment we're living in now, to where we're quote unquote socially distancing. That you know, places like First Care Provider are offering these online courses for free to where, yeah, it's now it's the, you know, it's just like CPR. Everyone kind of knew CPR and that I can do chest compressions. Now everyone can control basic bleeding. Fantastic. Yeah. It's cool. I think it's cool. You're on mute, Matt. I haven't done that in a long time. Um, it's kind of like what you said about the recommended list. It's recommended. It's not the list. Yeah. Um, could a belt work? Yeah. Is it optimal? Mm, not necessarily. Mm, I would never recommend something like no. a belt. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I think they have some data on that from somewhere. I think there's some people that put together data on that that yeah. let you know how that works. <laughs> but and and so I kind of associate it with people choosing their armor. Okay, AR-500 or something that's proven. Well, AR-500 might do something, but it might kill you too. Um, what about your handgun? Well, you could use that Sky. Why don't you go with a use Glock? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, whenever I uh, need recommendations for uh, weaponry, I, I know who to talk to, or at least I know where to go, right? Yeah. You know how many people, because of that uh, modcast, and you guys, it was so it's the M193, the 55 grain that's coming out at like 2,000 feet per second. Where I say, guys, guys are talking about armor, and I'm like, cool. Is it stop 556? I'm like, yeah, man, stop, stop MA55. I was like, man, that's awesome. Does it stop this? That we can exactly. be able to go get a Walmart? It, it, like, it, does it stop this bubble round right here? And they're like, what are you talking about? I said, we need to look that shit up. Let's, let's, I'm about to inform you against your will for about five minutes. Let's. <laughs> well, it's sad because I still see the person M855 is, it uh, goes through steel. No, it doesn't. That goes through polyplates. Shit. I know. Can't win. I don't know if I even want to start the conversation, but we were just talking about, um, like vehicle stuff, just in general, you know, like if you're on patrol, you know, unless you're on horseback or on bike or on your a foot patrol for some reason, you're going to be in a vehicle. You're going to pull over other people in a vehicle. And the way that they are, the way that the regulations are for vehicles to be made currently, you are. Uh, even now with the glass, I have a, a cousin-in-law that works for a, man, a, a supplier for Ford. So he tells me all this, you know, he's, he'll tell me more than everything I would have wanted to know about modern auto glass. And just inadvertently between the auto glass and the way that they have to construct the cars for safety. And then all the shit that they're shoving inside the car doors being uh, reinforcement, um, the the sound deadening, the materials and the um, airbags, you're they're kind of sort of becoming like armored vehicles. I know that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but you know all that shit that they almost put in those doors right now is how they would construct an armored car back in the day. I mean, uh, even the material of like the fabric that they're using for the airbags. You know, you get into a certain situation. You you might not get into that vehicle, especially with your uh, your hollow point ammunition that's designed to hit meat. It's not designed to hit a triple, quadruple laminated car window. And then try and go hit me. Like you're not going to get the same. It's not going to happen. You know, and we were just talking about certain um, certain rounds and things and certain situations that coming up like where I was like my uh, my patrol shotgun is literally just uh, loaded with uh, Brennicke shells specifically for that purpose. 
It's amazing <clears throat> modern technology in vehicles. I uh, responded to a head-on collision. Uh, it was I think it was last week, but I'm amazed that we didn't have any fatalities. But the the crumple zones were unbelievably effective. It was absolutely it was amazing. No, I, I I still can't believe no one died. But all the airbags 360 all went off. Um, I can't believe that the yeah it, it was amazing. But all that technology, it's uh, it's impressive. That being said, you mentioned auto glass. Um, Blowers did a cool video of him breaking up some um, um, side windows with uh, tomahawks and mentioned various laminate and stuff like that. I've seen videos of 45 ACP glance off uh, mm -hmm. passenger windows. Look at a Prius. Prius. Look at a Prius. Look at the rake on the front windshield of that Prius. And then yeah. whatever hollow point ammunition that you're gonna have going, because you know obviously like the, the windshield, the, the windscreen has to be thicker and has a, a different standard than the side. I mean, cause it's like I said, it's just all these inadvertent things where, you know, they're trying to, um, for safety, because they don't want it to shatter and explode. And while the car's spinning, all those projectiles coming at the passenger. Um, but if you have a, I don't know, you have a felony stop or a guy who doesn't want to get out of a car, well, now you have a barricaded suspect and however that's going to go, you know, whatever you, whatever you're thinking might happen. Well, I mean, you know, Will Petty's got a great video where he gets behind an Explorer. And it's just a regular patrol set up Explorer. And he shoots right through it, and nothing hits nothing hits a target behind. It, it's just some glass, and um, that's not like they don't put special glass in the police explorers. That's that's just explorer glass, and that's from eight years ago. So whatever standard that they have now is different now. So I don't know if we want to talk about that later or what, but it's, it's just well, interesting. What a great opportunity. If, yeah, if, if anyone has an opportunity to take a class where you're both shooting from the vehicle, from inside the vehicle out and shooting into or through a vehicle, do it because it is eye opening um, just to see the deflection of what glass does to a projectile, pistol and rifle. It's cool stuff. What's cool about him is that he'll go through like state police agencies where they have the money to get a, a modern vehicle. Cause if you're just doing it through like a, uh, you know, uh, a 2008, uh, Crown Victoria or like, uh, like a Buick LeSabre or like whatever PC mobile that you get, you know, it's, it's, it's just not the same. It's, 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 it's not the same anymore. Except those are the ones that we, we typically stop. Right. <laughs> Like so Buick Park cool. Avenue, a yeah, whole rack. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I, see, I see that felony forest. What's going on? Like, what are we doing? <laughs> Retired police vehicle? Yeah, we know it's on there. So it's funny how many people said that they were all excited about being on here. Yeah, I'll be there. Well, I mean, it's, you know. Ian said he's going to be about 30 minutes late. Oh, which one did? Ian. Oh, okay. Again? Oh, that's right. He did say he wanted to be in there. Yeah, he said he'll be about 30. Uh, we don't want him anyway. He'll probably be naked again. Nah, he can I'm probably wear clothes this time. He's probably only going to wear an Enigma from Filster. We can only hope. No, it's okay. I, I don't want to see that. Oh, it looks like, okay, let's see here. I'm going to, so Stephanie, if you are permanently removed, jump back in. Okay, hopefully that didn't remove her from the, she said she didn't want to be on camera, so she won't be here. Yeah, I'm keeping an eye on our roster for when, when people pop in and, or pop out or whatever. So this is open mic. What do you guys want to talk about? So Ian, Ian and I had a topic we were talking about, but he asked me to, that's why he said he's going to be 30 minutes late. We want to bring it up at the same time because it's really, 
it revolves around his article and just some, no. something I brought up to him. So he's here. I, I'm going to let him talk about that when he gets here. Is he speak here? Speak of the devil. You speak of the devil and he shows up. Or not. Or, yeah, maybe not. Maybe he's, try maybe he's trying to get his enigma on. That's right. Tell you what, I got to get a... Uh... I got to get a, a floodlight from my wall around and go back on my old Vanguard, and it's just stupid. I accidentally ordered two of the outside the waistband ones instead of an outside the waistband and inside the waistband. So, can you hear me? No. Can you hear me now? Okay. How about now? No, we still can't hear you. We can see you making hand and arm signals. That's a nice shoulder holster you're wearing. I'll be. I. Toilet. You backspace? I toilet backspace? You moonwalk. Now it looks like he got mad and rage, rage quit. I can hear him. That's why we can't have everything nice. He was really quiet. I think he was fucking with us too. Because he was talking, then he stopped talking. So Matt, what did you ever do with our uh, our uh, hero there that was uh, chatting with you, Tim, and I can't remember who else about trigger control? Remember that? I know I you've been in a million for breakfast. Yeah, I figured as much as many arguments as I've seen you in lately. Trigger control. Probably screenshotted it and turned it in. I just because I just chimed in and like pointed out a few things. Because he was like, oh, I've, I've trained with so-and-so. I trained these guys. Remember, he was the guy, well, I have the, uh, I have a tier one training certificate. Oh, I vaguely some, remember that. Or something like that. He's certified. And I was, and I was, that and, dude. And you that told doesn't you to exist. Boot? Yeah. Yeah. Did you boot him? I think, I don't remember if we booted him or if he left on his own, whatever. I just I read that and I just I I had to giggle. It's sad, but you got to. So many people are just kind of up in the night thinking that they they have the answer, but oh well. Well, it was typical. He had uh, just enough of a little bit of legitimate information, but a lot more bad or outdated information that he was dogmatic about, uh, you know, this is the de facto solution. Yeah. Well, you know, it's kind of sad because if people aren't constantly training, it's very easy to fall into that. Because if you're not constantly seeking the gr latest and greatest, you might fall into a rut where you think, well, this is it. I'm at the pinnacle of everything that's good, holy, and top of the line performance. But because you didn't push yourself, because you didn't seek betterment constantly, you got passed by. And I can't, I can't even imagine how it works on the medical side. No, you're right for about 15 minutes. Yeah. And then someone else writes a paper or something comes out and uh, someone publishes a, a, something in one of the periodicals and there's a different take on something. I'm always talking to my buddies that's that are in the medical field and they're just like, oh yeah, there's some new stuff that came. I was like, well, last week you were telling me this. And uh it 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 does change quite a bit. And then there's some people out there, honestly, you'll see them. Sometimes there'll be four or five authors on a paper and they'll believe, yeah, um witch hazel, you know, cures, you know, fucking piles or some shit like that, just some wazoo shit. So sometimes it's not just one person, it could be a group of people too that believe some wazoo shit. 
busting out the frankincense. Talking about rubbing it on. <laughs> well, it's like I said, uh, my last job, my last department, I had to work around the hospital and in the ER a lot. You know, and they focus on all this emergency medicine for folks. And then half the time, it was just you saw all these um, people coming in for whatever mental spectrum it was being, a, you know, because in Louisiana, they have something called a physician's emergency committal, you know, that's before it steps up to the for real committal and you get placement. And it's like between the drug addicts or your, you have a mental health issue and you use drugs or your drug use has turned into a mental health issue and all that stuff. And you watch them get folks get swamped with, you know, you speak, you know, emergency medicine is, the thing you got to keep I mean that's a lot of training a lot of years a lot of study on specifically on emergency medicine and I, I watch these folks get flooded with like emergency mental health when like the one psychiatrist guy or like the uh, they would have like one guy for that when I just be sitting there going and those are the people those are the patients you know as far as like safety for all the rest of the staff and themselves and officer safety and all that stuff. You're like, man, we got like nine of these folks in here tonight and five of them are combative. Like, what are we doing here? Uh, and I don't know what they're, I don't know what they're keeping up on that. Cause I know it's, it's hard enough to keep up on strong emergency medicine on top of shit that you, you're not the guy for that. And now you're the guy for, or the gal for that, you know, because you just kind of, you're thrust into it. And uh, it's kind of like being a, I don't know, I don't know, unless you're in an emergency room every day, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. So folks might not really know what's going on. That's why when you had that, that last mile cast that you had with Varg and all the guys where I was just like talking about reasonableness and I was just like, look, man, if you're talking to somebody and they literally see you as a dragon, you can't de-escalate that person. Like there's no, <laughs> there's nothing. So, you're not, you're literally not on the same plane of reality as that person. You know, to, 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 to add to that, I, before I started my journey down my road, I actually worked at uh, a, a mentally, a mental health facility for mentally ill mm -hmm. and mentally retarded people. And uh, I have met, uh, I've met a man who I can a hundred percent say, not only did he look like, but he thought he was Jesus Christ. And uh, he, like he said, they are, sometimes there's people that they, they're, they're in a different, you know, we'll call it a reality. They're, they're mental processes and there is no like uh, verbal judo. There is no, uh, any, any way you can sometimes deescalate things if they are set and believe in what they're believing. I mean, they, that's what's called mental instability is, uh, you, you know, you can't logically talk them down sometimes. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can offer them things, chocolate milk, you know, or whatever it is they want and that will fix the problem. But the reality is if when they're like, especially the people are manic. Um, yeah, it's like you can have strategies and techniques, but the best thing is, is, uh, you know, especially in a facility like that is, keep them from hurting themselves and other people, but trying to talk them down, like having a, having a, uh, a verbal strategy, like you would with a, a, you know, a person, you know, you, me, anyone else, uh, those techniques don't necessarily work. I mean, they're definitely worth trying, but I would say you got to, you know, 50, 50 that if they're going to be as effective on that person as they would, you know, a regular someone on the street that wasn't mentally unstable. It, it's amazing the things I, I could just, I could talk for the whole, this whole podcast and tell right. you stories about stuff I've seen, but I'm not going to do that. Cause it, go ahead, Jack, go ahead and continue your story. I didn't mean to interrupt you that way. No, man. It's, it's, it's just one of those things that I think, like you said, it's like whatever verbal judo, judo, whatever like I said, if you're, especially also like emergency room personnel are trained for emergency medicine, police are trained for police. And if you like, you want to talk about, de-escalation and all these things. And then, you know, you see whether uh, we use the term crisis intervention. So, you know, that's the training. They got CIT people, 
might think it's just uh, uh, the hostage negotiator, but it, it's it's kind of different than that. And then getting that training on knowing like what your left and right boundaries and things are. But yeah, I mean, it's, if you want to do it for your camera or you're going to think that you're getting filmed and you want to have something excuse like that, if you don't think you can articulate it, but I mean, there's just certain things where it's like, Hey man, uh, like, like you said, if, if the person thinks that you are, you are a demon, I can't, I can't, I can't validate your anger and your feelings if I don't see it. And I know that I'm not a demon. It's, you know, but if, if a can of Coke will make that, will make you better for the moment. Sure, man, I will spend my own goddamn money and I will buy you a can of Coke. Like you said, it's like, it can be as simple as some chocolate milk. And I think there's some of that, like what, what was in that past modcast is like kind of checking yourself for your like, Oh shit, you disrespect me? It's like, no, this is a fucking crazy person. Like they disrespect themselves like 10 times a day. They, you know, like they don't, you know, it's, but it's, and as well, like you said, working in that, if, um, people who have mental health issues. And like I said, when you think you see a demon, your pain threshold is different than a normal person. Your strength is different than a normal person. And then you, you combine that with, um, whatever narcotic whatever chemical that you're doing because some of these things like aren't even narcotics what's that that uh that salt? Cro- cro- what bath salts yeah that's that's that synthetic meth and then pcp came back and then flocka is is pvp and i can't remember what it's what it's called and then um you got that shit i want to say it's crocodile where they just you literally make it out of um, household cleaning materials to, to get like a, a heroin like effect, even though it's just like you're dying inside. But, um, like, like I said, it's just like what Scott said, it's like, that could be an entire whole other episode. So I'm just not even gonna, I'll, I'll leave it right there. Did you go through CIT? Yeah. So I went through years ago, and I, I, I don't want to, but I need to go through again. And uh, I remember one of the big things was to understand our perspective is completely different from theirs. And we need to talk them through to explain to us, what are you seeing? And it got downright creepy when you were talking to some of these people and what right. they thought and they were seeing. It's like, well, this is, this is so I had a, almost I had a really, natural. I had a really dynamic guy. I got really lucky, the guy who ran the class. And he was very dynamic. He was very knowledgeable. Um, you know, one of the things that he set up was he had a guy sitting in a chair and you're trying, you, you're trying to talk to the person, but they had four or five other people in the class saying different things to them at the same time. And your point of view is like, why isn't this guy understanding me? And like literally this person is getting drowned out by all these different voices of like you're a piece of shit you're nothing kill this fucking guy fuck this cop and i i actually had uh my old partner um she did not have any of the cit training she just worked there a long time and i remember she picked up on someone like we rousted this guy and he woke up you know he was sleepy hungry angry that's how I perceived it. And then, you know, he. He's frozen in time. That's why we can't have anything nice. Did uh, y'all see the um, legislation that was put forward? In South Carolina, taking away ketamine from EMS so they cannot. I moved all. So they can sedate those who may be, may require sedation. No. Yeah. Why? Uh, probably came out of Colorado and that Elijah, uh, I can't remember his name, last name, but probably came out of that case. Be sad if they can't. 
Jack, you froze for quite some time. Yeah, that's what I figured. Once I saw everybody do this, so it, it was, uh, like I said, basically just had a guy that we encountered all three of his personalities. One was hungry, one wanted to know what time it was, and one wanted to kick our fucking ass. And if you wait 30 seconds, you'll hit the next loop. And the hungry one is the one that won. And he moved on. We told him where to get some food. Um, and as far as I, I don't know what the case law is for, but yeah, the, I mean, there's certain frequent flyers that you're going to get where you're like, Hey man, can we, can we just give this guy some how doll? I, I used to joke and call it uh, vitamin H and, or, or how doll or what the fuck I mean, we had one guy that we had to get for a corner certificate and his, because in the state of Louisiana, the, we don't have the, the highest medical officer in your parish, which is what we refer to our, as our counties, is the coroner. The coroner is not necessarily the medical examiner. And with the ability that a coroner certificate, as far as um, a committal goes, uh, the, the coroner's got quite a lot of stroke, if you think about it. They, they're probably one of the more powerful law enforcement officers in the state to, by how they can deprive you of your liberty by saying, this is a crazy motherfucker, let's commit him. Or um, this person's dead. Right. Or this person's dead. Right. And, uh, but, uh, how the fuck was I going with that? But, yeah, so we ended up put the guy in the ambulance. He tried to leave. We had to restrain him. And I saw how loaded that syringe was with ketamine and the amount of time that I'm still me and two other guys are holding on to this guy as he slowly faded into the K hole was phenomenal. I think it was like five minutes. I was like, damn, this dude has, a fucking, <laughs> this dude has a fucking tolerance, but it's also, you know, whatever chemicals that he's, that are already on board or is that's already on board and whatever he's used to and whatever. Cause I don't think he's a habitual ketamine user, but just between all the outside factors, it was like you said, you have one of the, you know, when we have an episode about combatives, when we have an episode about jujitsu, when we have an episode about this and it's like, yeah, you know, just sitting there and, and, and you try to put somebody in a stress position. That's like, well, if that dude doesn't feel fucking pain, and you can't, and you're not actually fighting for your life. So you can't break his arm. You can't break his nose. You can't do this. You're just sitting there and it's just like, all right, they can well, it's like you're 150 pounds and I'm 250 pounds. So I'm just going to be on your chest. You know, like, I'm just going to put this, I, then that's what we're going to do. And you're going to pass out and you're going to wake up tied up and you'll get your chocolate milk at the at the place and then i'll see you in two more months when they let you out and your mom calls again so good old you know, this, i don't know if they show it anymore i doubt it it's super old i remember seeing it when i was younger but there's footage and this is probably from i would say the late 70s maybe the 80s but it looks like it's maybe in la or someplace where it's at where it's at's not really relevant but there's uh a, an obviously, uh, in, well, under the influence person that they're trying to arrest, and he's naked, of course, uh, and he's under he's on PCP, and there's probably half a dozen or more cops on him, and he, they, I mean, they're they're hitting him with the nightclubs, uh, nightsticks. That shows you how old the video is. They're hitting him with the you know the coop, the nightsticks, and uh, they've got handcuffs on him behind his back, and he breaks the handcuffs he breaks out of the handcuffs they had him and they double uh handcuffed him with two sets and he, he still continued to break they couldn't control the guy um they literally just had to dogpile him and they still couldn't control him even though they were you know there was like probably six or seven dudes literally dogpiled on top of him and he was still throwing them around like they were little kids um, well if you're going to use the term you should use it correctly it's pig piling not dog piling. okay that point taken. Um, but on, on the flip side of that, um, going back to, uh, I'll throw out one of my uh, mental institution stories. Again, you never know, again, what state of mind they're in. 
and just because of their physical stature, uh, don't underestimate their their strength ability. So, I when I when I tell you the story, I am not exaggerated in in any way. So, because you're gonna be like, what the fuck? So there's a little guy, and I say a little guy. He's probably three and a half feet tall, but he's a full grown man. He's probably in his late forties, early fifties. But you remember the movie Beetlejuice when he's sitting in the waiting office, his head's been shrunk down. Dude had a head exactly like that. And but this dude, he looked kind of evil he had the haircut and he was always looking at his scrunch and he had his hands and he'd always you know he's self-stimulated in front of himself and he was always like ah angry he's just like he was pissed off at the world he was like it's like someone's sergeant major and someone walked on his grass and he would walk around and he was a little dude and he didn't really talk too much but he would stand around and watch the other people you know whatever we were doing he was standing so if you've ever been in, like, well, if you've been in any type of, you know, uh, government building, there's, uh, you know, they use that solid core wood doors and the heavy duty, like three hinge, because they're so damn heavy. They like three of the industrial strength hinges. So we had a set of double doors uh, that were made out of, you know, so two solid core wood doors with the industrial uh, hinges mounted in steel, in a steel frame. He was standing with his back to those doors. And he was just sitting there watching the other, the other clients, uh, you know, we were in the gym, playing volleyball, doing whatever they were doing. And he started having an argument with somebody. Like, you know, we don't know what, again, I don't know what he was seeing or who he was talking to. But he was just sitting there and his, like I said, his back is pretty much kind of against the door. And he takes, you know, he starts yelling at whoever's yelling. And he takes his arm and... Uh, his right arm, and he just brings it straight out in front of him and then just brings it straight back like he's elbowing someone behind him. He elbowed a solid wood core door on three industrial hinges mounted in a steel frame and brought it off. Like he, he caused the door, the wood broke, and it came off. And he, and he didn't even move. Like he was like, it was like the Bruce Lee punch, man. He was like, he's, that's how close he was to the door. And he just brought his arm forward, one quick motion, and he brought that door off the hinges. And I was like, one, I was like, whoa that did that just happen but more importantly i was thinking now i'm gonna have to do paperwork on this dude because he's probably just broke his arm you know i i mean or, or damaged himself because that's like the other thing is they keep like records like if you know you know if a guy gets a bruise or something you know for abuse stuff so <clears throat> this dude knocked this door off of its hinges which is a you know superhuman type feet in itself and then he had nothing wrong with like no bruising uh no injuries whatsoever to his his arm which is amazing i've seen other you know clients that do the same thing like bend their wrist back at a weird angle and then they just like slam it on a, a solid wood table no damage whatsoever like again it's something it's in the you know the mind that and the strength thing that sometimes you know when you they you know they talk about uh you know retard strong that's not an exaggeration. It's not a, a slur. I mean, that's just, there's truth to that. I've seen it firsthand. And sometimes when people under influence uh, of narcotics, you know, PCP, for example, um, and other, like you mentioned, crocodile and other things, they, there's some things that can be done that are, there's no medical explanation for. Uh, and you can't, like, how do you know that when you walk up onto that scene? You know, after you, you had to sit there and figure out what this dude's, you know what he's on you don't know what he's on and then you got to figure out is this dude gonna like do something like that that's the unknown there really is i don't think there's a, a textbook answer or you know there's a series of probably processes you could work through to see which one works for you and it's like i said sometimes it's chocolate milk you know it's just getting them off of whatever has got them upset or distracting I, I th- them i think a huge part of this is to understand that these things are possible and it's very easy to underestimate the the person you're dealing with. Oh yeah, but it's possible, and it it happens daily, and, and everybody knows. You know, it's I don't know, man. Like everybody, if, even if you're not in law enforcement, everybody knows that one guy from your town. Everybody knows that one lady from your town who's like touched. You know, they're just, and everybody goes, yeah. Like, like they're nice, but we really don't like to fuck with them because there was that everybody everybody always has like that 
it has a story where they have an incident with them. You know, it's it's just, but it, it's, I don't know, it's, of all the stuff that people are talking about, mental health and people want to talk about de-escalation and people want to talk about this and talk about that. When you talk about the realities of it, people are like, ah, we don't, it's a little bit more complicated. Well, the sad thing about it also is, okay, yeah, the whole defund the police and all that. And we, first off, our wages aren't the best as it is, but we don't get the, the training to be able to tackle all of these issues. If we had all the training that the world wanted us, wanted us to have, we'd never be able to do our job. So yeah, no uh, doubt about that. I mean, good Lord, even if we, even if we were one day training, four days working for every work week, it would still, it still wouldn't right. be sufficient. I mean, and, the, and then who's going to pay for that? Yeah. So, so my you say like, okay, we'll go do it. Who's paying for it? You know? Right. Exactly. So my solution to this though, is stop calling the police about things that are not law enforcement issues. Solved. You're welcome. You're welcome, everybody. Oh, Matt, that bus left the station, uh, what, in like the 60s? I don't know. I thought it was funny. It's true, though. Yeah, it would sure be nice. Talk to your neighbors. Call the right people. Don't call the cops if, you have, if your house is flooding. People do that. Why? You call Mark Smith if the house is flooding because he's a plumber. That's right. And he's got a beaver. Yes, That's right. <laughs> I'm waiting to tell somebody that they're pregnant from the blue toilet seat. That's, uh, that's, crazy crazy. Shit. that's in the file cabinet, dude. I'm going to look like yeah, it's, it's, God when I bust that out. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. It's wild. They, uh, they, you, are, you are the immediate prime suspect, like, you know, for, for uh, insubordination of, of marriage. That's funny. So, Scott, we have this Ian person who we probably can hear now. We could hear him before, but we were giving him a hard time. He's muted right now, though. Oh, great. He's doing sign language again. Unfortunately, the people that are only listening. Down that sushi. Why, is it, why sushi? Why? So my audio this time? Yeah, I can, we can hear you. Okay, good. So, uh, Andrew Fisher. Hello, Ian. I see Jack. Again, it's like romper room. Remember the little... I see Jack Lewis. I see who's that down there. Oh, and there's I a see Mike Mark Lewis. Smith. I say David Simmerly. Who's down there? Darren T. Hi, Darren. Yeah, Darren Talbot. Hello. Extreme oh. Gear Labs. I'm old school panelist. There's Mike Lewis. He just jumped on. So, uh, just a quick note. That is my father. He just passed away this past week. I'm at his house doing well. The things you do after someone, you know, goes on. So, uh, anyway, I just thought I'd... That's his decoration style, I don't know. But anyway... It has character. Uh, my God, it's got character. So, um, I was talking with Scott Wolf recently about a topic that came up in um, an AR Bill Junkie article. Uh, and, in fact, it's great that Mike Lewis is here as well because he can uh, geek out on a specific aspect of this. But before I get to that particular part of, uh, of the article that, like, that was a catalyst for Scott and I to start uh, discussing it offline, um, it actually falls under a broader concept that I'd like to talk about a little bit. And um, uh, it's called pedagogical approximation. And it's not something I made up. I, I, during the COVID thing, I was listening to this online series of uh, seminars that in fact, Matt Lanfair uh, kind of turned me on to as well, master class. I don't know if you've heard of this thing. Oh, yeah. but, uh, a lot of great people are on there talking about a variety of topics uh, from like Annie Leibovitz and photography to uh, Malcolm Gladwell and writing and, and just all these like people at the top of the profession. So one of them was a guy named Neil deGrasse Tyson. A lot of you probably heard of the guy. And um, he was talking about this idea that um, depending on your audience, depending on the topic, and depending on the context, uh, 
there are degrees of 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 detail uh, of true um, uh, uh, of high resolution versus low resolution, and you call that pedagogical approximation. So, what is pedagogy? First of all, uh, it's the method and practice of teaching, especially as an academic subject or a theoretical concept. So that's pedagogy. Uh, pedagogical approximation, the example he used, which I think is perfect, and you'll see the crossover here to our industry in a moment, uh, is uh, describing the earth to, say, a fifth grader or someone who, uh, or, or perhaps someone who's not a fifth grader, but it's not really truly relevant to the discussion to get into finite detail. So you can call the earth, you know, a perfect sphere, which to a degree, uh, for an audience, for a, a context, works perfectly fine. But then, you know, you go from that to more detail. Uh, and that way he's called it, or, or, or next step that he used was um, uh, calling it an oblate spheroid, which is more true. You know, like when you spin a pizza dough, it kind of flattens out due to centrifugal blah, blah, blah. And that is also true, but adds more detail to perfect sphere like a bowling ball. And then finally, uh, to the uh, extreme, you could give it even more refinement and call it a pear-shaped oblate spheroid because, in fact, below the equator, it's a little wider, but you see where I'm going with it. So um, depending on what's discussed and depending on uh, the context and the speed of delivery of information, um, do you really need to get the fine detail all the time? And it came up maybe some months ago now, I remember a, a side conversation with some folks um, talking about this term muscle memory. So do muscles truly have memory? Of course not, there's no cerebral cortex, there's no gray matter, there's no white matter. It, it, it's not a thing. But if the people understand what you're talking about, does it really matter? And unless you're talking to uh, you know, neuroscience PhD candidates, you, know, you, you probably don't need to get into other things like uh, you know, uh, a BF Skinner and condition response and stimulus and, 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 and uh, other things called um, procedural memory, which is a legit term. When, and in fact, I was talking to Riley Bowman and he and I kind of settled on that as probably being a little more accurate, yet at the same time accessible to the layman. It kind of makes sense just on the surface of it. Um, so, you know, that, that topic of muscle memory kind of like spun up. It was in probably one of the threads on one of the pages. I forget exactly where, Matt, maybe you remember. But um, uh, people were kind of getting worked up. You know, is it true? Is it not true? Versus uh, do people understand what you're getting at? And if that's happening, then you're communicating. And if people understand what you're getting at broadly for the context of the conversation, does it work? So there are times when we use things very loosely but we don't need high resolution, high definition on it. But there are other times that we want to dig deeper on it. So an example that um, uh, Scott, well, Scott and I kind of went down a rabbit hole. Thank you. Hey, Mike, you there? You got audio? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, good. So this uh, is a, kind of a layup for you uh, and Scott Wolf. Uh, definitely the topics or, or the things that you had to say are highly relevant as well. So. I want to talk about pedagogical approximation as it applies to this MOA, minute of angle term. And we commonly hear it described as simply an inch, or sometimes about an inch for every 100 yards. And there's a time when that works. There's a time when it doesn't work. And at what point should we start providing more resolution to this MOA idea, not idea, a thing, um, and get away from simply saying it's one inch per hundred yards. And then, of course, we start mixing it with meters. And, and about 100 meters and about 100 yards, it's about the same, but you start adding distance and it starts to deviate much more because, well, angles. Um, and to highlight the difference here, I'm going to hold this up here to the camera. I hope it picks up. Uh, I've got two targets here. One is the current version of the Army Zero target. It's called the Alpha 8 target, and it's got a set of grid lines on there. You can probably see them right there. And it's meant to be used at 25 meters. And um, it's meant to be sighting system and weapon agnostic. So uh, that's why there's no numbers across the edges. There's no 
there's no further detail on it. Um, but what the Army kind of did was they went with the idea, and maybe Mike can provide further background info on its development, but the bottom line is that those squares that are about an MOA at 25 meters are not right. So you'll notice when you compare it to the true MOA target, and this is not, a, I'm not chilling for right in the rain, I'm really not, but it goes to show and highlight the problem. So this is a true MOA target by right in the rain. It, it on the surface appears to be the same target, kind of is, but it's slightly detail different. You'll see that this concept of about an inch per hundred starts to matter when you compare how these grid lines match up. They don't exactly match up. You'll notice that for every, I wrote it down here because I'm a dumb dumb. For every seven true MOA squares, you're indicated by eight of these fake MOA squares on the bottom target. Correct. So it starts to matter, especially when you're doing um, uh, bold adjustments, barring a term for call for fire, bold adjustments up close. But you'll also see it when you're doing not so bold distance in the other direction, when you go farther out. So, um, Scott and, and M Scott, you and I were talking about how it starts to matter and that we need to get away from mass producing shooters to understand MOA as simply one inch per 100 yards or 100 meters. Because right. of course, the meters yards thing, well, there's a discrepancy there automatically. But um, when do we start telling people it isn't just one inch? When do we get more resolution to it? And then of course, Mike, you're the uh, math nerd that actually um, designed these targets or had a hand in the Army one, it went through a, a staffing process, I understand. Uh, but um, you definitely have, um, this is your brainchild with Cane Brakes uh, Association with Right in the Right. So, Scott, so, what were I'll your thoughts? address that. Okay, Mike, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, absolutely. first, what we do not want to do is undermine the Alpha 8 target. The Alpha 8 target was also mine, as we know. Um, and it, it is a quarter inch grid. You done messed okay. up with that one. Well, that was one of the, it was, it was compromise. Anyone who has been involved in any process of developing any thing for greater consumption knows that there's compromises. That was a compromise and, made. And, and, and the, the staffing was, and the staffing, yeah. the answer was, ah, it's close. It's good. Okay. And Ian probably would remember that I, uh, I voiced concerns at that time saying, no, we want it as close as we can be. It, it's good, it's close. Now with that, a quarter inch grid, it is roughly a 12 and a half percent, roughly one eighth mathematical error. But what does that really mean? How many of our shooters shoot well enough to realize that? The answer is not many. So in the grander scheme, yes, it buffs. But I wasn't happy with that compromise. I wanted it to be true. And the, the current one that Ian showed, the true MOA, is a 0.286 inch grid, which is, it, it's down to the nearest one thousandth of an inch. I, I don't think you can get any, any closer than that. Um, but it, it, it really does become a matter of, you know, at what level does it matter? If you're holding someone to a six minute standard, yeah. But if, if you're say a one to one and a half minute shooter, and, and this became very apparent to me because a, a couple of years ago, somebody said, hey man, you got a slide deck uh, that you can help us out with the process. Eh, I do, but it's real bare bones. Let me, go, let me go shoot some groups, take some photos and really do the step by step. And I did and I cranked on my optic. And it just so happened that my first group was a nice, you know, five shot, one ragged hole. Uh, my mean point of impact came out according to the grid, eight minutes down and eight minutes left. So, okay, let me adjust my windage first. And I did my minutes to mill conversion because my optics in mills. Minutes to mill conversion, eight minutes, boom, done. Fired another group, one ragged hole. Oh shit, I'm a full minute of angle off to the right now. What happened? Let me recheck my math on my mean point of impact. Nope, my math is good there. 
Let me recheck my math for a minute to mill. Nope, my math is good there. Wait a minute, it's a quarter inch grid. And this is where most people don't see that. But this leads into the greater thing I think Ian was talking to about, you know, instructional methodologies and whatnot. You've got pedagogy. We also need to address andragogy. Pedagogy is typically thought of as teaching children. Andragogy is teaching adults. But you do use pedagogical processes with adults as well, uh, specifically when they don't have the previous experience or the previous knowledge levels to pick up where you're going with it using the andragogical principles. Pedagogy would be appropriate in those instances. Um, but specificity is important. Words mean things. Hey, Mike. No. Yes, sir. Before, I'm sorry, Scott, I, I know you need to jump in, but I just need to clarify one thing before we get too far from it. Uh, I, I certainly, because I still have ties to the military, uh, I certainly don't, my message wasn't meant to undermine the Army product. It's a good product. We don't need to dump it in, in for anything because it's what we want. It's what we need. It's a vast improvement. That being said, there are times when you start getting precision-y and the gun ammo combination starts to matter and the, yeah. and the shooter brings to it things that matter that do not express themselves in the mill spec guns with ball ammo with the mass produced general shooter. So for the mass produced large organizational, you know, effort, again, so maybe there's approximation there. For that organization, this thing works. For high precision, high skill level shooters, and, and for gun ammo combinations that can bring the heat and, and uh, you know, those differences don't rub out, that's when you start needing something a little more refined. So uh, with that, Scott, I, I just have to yeah, throw so, that caveat out there before I get uh, Yeah, so just to, to kind of bring everyone, especially the listeners, up to speed. So what this started off was with the uh, article uh, or interview that Ian did on precision and accuracy with the AR-15. And uh, I, I hit up Ian afterwards about it. And this is more, I'm going to talk about both points. So what Ian talked about first is my, uh, my interaction with Ian on this was that, hey, this is something I've seen for decades with instructors. It's more of an instructor teaching point. So it goes to the, what Mike was talking about. Sometimes you have to use simpler terms uh, if you have people that are uninitiated versus people that are initiated. Um, so with that said, I get it. You have, to, you have to teach to your audience. But I look at the the way this has been done, and I learned this way too. You know, it, it, so what we're talking about here is called inch per hundred yards, or sometimes referred to as shooters shooters moa. And this is something if you've been in the precision world any time, like this is like probably a dead horse. It gets beaten quite a bit. But my point with bringing it up to Ian is as instructors, as subject matter experts that teach this, I think we've been doing this for so long. And it's always been under there, oh, well, I'm going to keep it you know, simple for my audience. Well, I look at the audience that we have today. I mean, we're like, look at the podcast that we've done. We've talked about cognitive uh, issues. We've talked about, you know, like what Ian was just talking about, automaticity, you know, AKA muscle memory, uh, myelination. We've talked about some very complex and science, you know, uh, intense topics sometimes about that, that ultimately tie back to shooting. Yet we're going to say, you know what, but my audience is too dumb to understand what, tr what an what actual MOA is because it's, you know, because math is hard, I guess. I don't know. But I, so my point being when I was talking to Ian is, is as instructors, if we really want to be and increase the knowledge base of, you know, being technically and tactically proficient, we should probably start presenting this material in its factual form. So like I said, Back in the day, somebody made a decision that MOA was going to be one inch at 100, two inch at 200, and they dropped off the point zero four seven. And, and of course, everyone's like, well, I'm not a precision shooter. I don't need to know this. You know, the, the margin of error uh, is, is not big enough, blah, blah, blah. There's, there's, there's legitimate, uh, you know, context is something that where it does matter is where I'm going to kind of tie into this as well with what why it does matter because specifically to what ian was talking about with when you start talking about accuracy and precision and ian mentioned it and i think the second part you have to remove as many variables as possible 
and we have an audience of people out there that, that um, continue to equate minutes of angle with one inch at 100 yards, which is a linear approximation of what MOA is. Now, this is the captain obvious statement, why are we using a linear approximation to describe something when it's really about an angle? That's what the A is in MOA. We're talking about angles, so why not talk about angles uh, when we talk about this? And so when we present the material, my whole premise with, with Ian is, is when we present this material, even if they're new beginners, they're probably even better, is a minute of angle is 1.047 inches. And that compounds as you go. And where this gets more complicated is, is that, you know, it's one minute of angle at 100 and 10 at 1,000 is not an accurate statement because you have a compounding error there of 0 0.047. And the difference is, is that, like, if you just want to throw out with like 308, the difference with, with that compounding error will throw you, you know, your, your distance off uh, approximately 17 inches. You have a, you have a 5% compounding error for every distance, right? So again, I don't think our audiences these days, our students are unable to understand what a minute of angle is. And I think part of the problem is, is because, of, you know, not all, but some of the instructors don't truly understand how MOA works. And some people are under the misconception that mills are, in, you know, a, a metric system, which they're not, it's a base 10 system. Uh, it just so happens to fit very well into the metric system. And they're, you know, basically, because it, it is it is mathematical. It's like, and this is my pun for the night, it's trigonometry, uh, if you want to call it weaponized math. And the point is, is that you have to explain some math. And it's not the most, um, uh, I, I know Ian would like that one. It's, uh, it, it's kind of boring. And sometimes it's kind of like brain scratching. But... <clears throat> If you think about it, and once someone breaks it down, if you can explain it and you understand the concept of what a MOA is, it makes more sense. And at the end of the day, someone's going, like, well, why do I really need to know this? I'm just trying to get all my bullets in, in, the, in the X so I can zero. But here's where it does become an issue. So, okay, so you're an AR dude, and let's just say you're not shooting out to 1,000. You're in that still, that old school, we'll just say, you know, uh, you know 50 meters to we'll just say 800, some guys are shooting 800, you know, uh, with their low power barrel optics. But the, the issue becomes, is so now we're tying, we're you know, Ian's article talking about accuracy and precision. There's a difference between the two. And when you have a compounding error by believing that one inch is 100, or at 100, one, it's one inch at 100 meters and that compounds, guys are also using ballistic computers, right? So track garbage in, garbage out you have an induced error. That's one area where you can have an induced error. If you don't know, uh, if you think you're using inch per, and then your turrets. So if you're using a, a scope uh, where you can turn the dials on the turrets for windage and elevation, um, you have to know what those graduations are. Even sometimes some of the lower middle, middle, uh, middle uh, the line, lower in scopes, it'll say a minute of angle, but it's really inch per hundred yards for the for the clicks for each click. So you have to know what the the graduation system actually is for the because sometimes the reticle that you can have reticles in, that have stadia lines in there that might tell you it's like uh, you know point uh, two mils between stadia lines or whatever the graduation is. But if your turrets are different, you're actually not moving at that distance. So higher in scopes, better in scopes, it works. So when you're trying to eliminate as many possibilities as possible, you got to understand, one, what true MOA is, as far as mathematically, and then you also have to understand why it's important. And then you have to understand that um, the way you're, if you're using turrets or your magnificate, the reticle, if it's actually inch per hundred yards, when you're making your adjustments on it, it's for even for low power vera opticals, or even for using like on the EOTech with the uh, 68 minute of angle, there's a way you can range with that based off of that. And then you know that that <coughs> one minute of angle dot will cover an eight inch target at 800 meters. And it actually even says in their, in their, their instruction manual that it's 1.047. They're clear that it's a true MOA. So when you mix up shooter's MOA 
or inch per hundred yards with true MOA, and then you have turrets that don't necessarily match the, the reticle. You, these are all the influences that that you should people have to take into account when you start speaking specifically what Ian was talking about in that article, which is both precision and accuracy. And if you want to try to obtain it, because I know guys start getting wrapped around the axle about this sometimes, and they're trying to figure out what it is, and it's like, well, are, are you're putting stuff into your ballistic calculator there? Is it? Are you truly in inch per hundred yards? Are you in true MOA? What are you using? And understand this. And the whole premise of this is that I think the the beginner shooter, you know, obviously once they're at that stage when you're talking, explaining the minute of angle to them, if you present it to them as inch per uh, hundred yards, you're putting them at a disadvantage of a foundation that's going to basically hinder them as they progress in their, you know, call it their their career in this. If they move into precision shooting or once they go to grasp this, uh, the concept further on down the line. If you teach them right off the bat, a minute of angle is 1.047 inches and explain how, and to stop thinking linearly as one inch is 100 and start thinking in angles because you have a reticle or stadia lines or whatever it is inside your scope. So if I shoot a target, let's just say at like 750 some odd meters and and my spotter goes, or I look through, and I look through my, you know, my scope, and it's like, well, that looks like six inches to the right. Well, what if it's, like, what am I using to gauge that necessarily? And then what if it's nine? And then if I'm thinking in inches, now I have to go through an, an extra step of converting inches in my head or on a piece of paper in front of me into what that needs to be for a correction uh, in my, on my scope or my, whatever my optic is. When I, right there in front of my face, I have a reticle, a, a calibrated ruler. So if you understand those graduations, even if it's just a dot, I can look instead of going, hey, I think that's six inches, I can actually use the calibrated dot or the sta stadia line that I know exactly what it is and go, oh, that's three, that's either, you know, that's three MOA or it's three mils, and that's all I dial on my scope or what I have to correct for. And this is why it, this is why this is all important. Is it ties into different pieces. And if you're using different, uh, like I said, different, you know, inch, like the difference between a, inch, a shot at, a, at the numbers that come out from a ballistic calculator like JBM or anything from a, a 308 from inch per hundred yard to a thousand and in, uh, true MOA is about 17 inches of difference. That's in some cases, that's a miss. That's not even taking in atmospherics. So why is it important? And again, going back to should I teach the lowest common denominator or should I just teach what I think is, the, what I know is the right one, what I think everyone is capable of understanding. And I think, at, you know, in this day and age, there's no excuse for instructors. If you're gonna talk about minute of angle, that you should give your students that the true knowledge that it's not one inch at 100, uh, it's 1.047 inches and then why it's important. And that ties into, again, not only the, the teaching aspect of it, but like if I'm trying, if you're trying to help somebody uh, determine, you know, both precision and what their accuracy is and how to obtain that, they need to know those parts of that equation. Otherwise they're gonna be scratching their head wondering, why, you know, how come I keep, how come I keep changing and moving my turrets and I keep changing and I can't get that zero that I want or I can't get the, the, uh, the accuracy that I want out of this this rifle. <clears throat> so that's kind of where, where we kind of, you know, he and I were discussing about this, the merits of um, not only this, the teaching it, but also um, our audience and what the responsibility as an instructor is or subject matter experts we have if, you know, to be able to, if we're not able to explain it, because one thing we've always, I think everyone that's come on PNS has always said is, be able to explain the hows and the whys. And if you as an instructor don't understand how to explain it, then that's obviously an area that, you know, self-development self you can work on because you might understand it, but sometimes explain it in the simplest terms or terms that are easy enough for the, un, the uninitiated to grasp is a, you know, it's, a, it's a, an art in itself sometimes. But I think it's something that, as a, as an industry, I think the trainer should should move to, towards um, in trying to perfect. Because I think it just again, it's not it's not factually correct. It's not mathematically correct. So, <clears throat> and like 
I know Mike was saying you got to make some compromises sometimes. And I remember this uh, a couple years back now that when the marksmanship man, the new marksmanship manual is coming out, I got a a draft. I don't know, it wasn't even probably a draft. It was still a rough copy um, of it. I believe it was from Ash, from Ash S. And there was a port part in there where um, it mentions minute of angle and it uses inch per hundred yards. And I was like, hey man, this isn't technically correct. And I'm not trying to be pedantic, but it's it's wrong mathematically. I mean, this is not how what a minute of angle is. And you know, and again, it was like, well, you know, it was a topic of discussion. People thought it wasn't big enough a deal to to you know, you know, it's only point point zero zero point four seven uh, or point zero four seven. But the, the the in the bigger picture of things, if you're going to teach something teach it to them right i mean like would you know that's not something that's that's a big enough error at a thousand meters that like if that was artillery fire would you want it to be that far off you know what i mean it's like that's where i look at it too is it's like uh yeah is that um you know if you're going to talk about accuracy and precision then those are important factors and, and I think the basic combat soldier, you know, I'm an 11B dude, started off as an 11B, um, and I've trained dudes in third world countries with third grade educations. There's a way you can explain this to people and, again, show them how to do it uh, and then why it matters. And, again, understand their equipment. Because even you could understand a of angle all day long, but if your turrets or your reticle is in a different, if it's in shooter's MOA, then you have to understand that and um adapt to it so you you know what kind of adjustments to make and what to expect out of your gun because you know guys sitting there looking at his gun thinking oh i gotta go i should buy a better piece of equipment it must be something else when it might just be he's got incompatible systems so yeah, i'll let scott, you talk scott you brought up some great points um looks like ian's reading right now uh, so it was some great points and, and thank you for that. And along the lines of specificity you're talking about, mathematically incorrect, you're right. You're absolutely right. And we keep talking yards, yards, yards. But guess what the military works in? At least the Army. The Marine Corps still got this weird mix of yards and meters. But the Army's working in meters. 100 meters is not 100 yards. 100 meters is 109.361 yards. So now we get into tolerance stacking. 1.047 inches at 100 yards, but 100 meters is 109.361 yards. So what's it come out to? One MOA is 1.145 inches. And it doesn't sound like much, 1.047 to 1.145, but like you were just talking about the tolerance stacking. And, you know, I agree with you on the specificity. I agree with you on all of that. Uh, I do think uh, boiling it down is a good thing in some cases because we don't want to reach cognitive overload. Cognitive, cognitive load is a thing. And I've actually had it happen where I stand up in front of a, a, a small class and start throwing numbers out because, Scott, you do this all the time. I do this all the time. Ian does this all the time. And I look at these dudes and 15 minutes into minutes and mills. And these guys are at vapor lock, man. <laughs> it was okay. Okay, guys, take a break. We're going to regroup, go take a break, come back in five minutes. And, and we don't want to reach that point. <clears throat> it is simple. Units of angular measure. A circle has 360 degrees. Everybody knows that one minute of angle is one sixtieth of one degree. And it's kind of tough to envision until you start drawing, drawing things. And then we want to talk about mills. Oh, shit. Now that's a new thing. Are we talking metric mills or are we talking NATO mills where it's 6283 versus 6400? And the, the end result of that is that 100 meters, it's still 10 centimeters. Either way you go, and there is a slight difference, but I, I geeked out one day and did the math, and it came out to like 0. 0.00000 something millimeters is the difference, which is, it's, it's nothing. It's there, but it's effectively nothing. And we do want specificity. We do want to teach people. 
And this is the, the challenge for an instructor. You have to know, A, what you are teaching. Because you can't teach shit you don't know. B, you have to have a contextual understanding. C, you have to be able to relate to your audience, which may mean, I got to break it down a different way. It may mean I got to break it down three different ways because I've got different types of learners in my class. And that's all on the instructor. You have to have the base knowledge. You have to have the contextual knowledge. You have to have the knowledge as a teacher. And that makes it very difficult. And then we start to look at, okay, how detailed do I get? How detailed does my class need to be? Or do I say, okay, 1MOA is 1.047 inches at 100 yards. This is why, boom, draw a circle, draw your degrees, draw all this shit, and have them envision the units of angular measurement. And then say, effectively, in the field, you can round it and say it's roughly one inch at 100 yards. It's not going to be mathematically correct, but this will give you a rough field swag. Do we do that? Or do we go, this is what it is, and this is the only way? We have to have that understanding. Uh, I'd like to get your and Ian's thoughts on that. No, I agree with that completely. And and but the problem, what I what I'm really kind of saying is as instructors, you're right. I mean, you, I agree with everything you just said. But I, what I'm saying is, instead of saying inch per hundred yards, one in a hundred, you say one point zero four seven. Because again, somewhere down the line, as they progress in their career of shooting and they become more cognizant of others, they're going to realize that that why that why that point. 047 is important or they may never but the mat the fact of the matter is that as an instructor we're presenting a correct you know it goes back to is the world round or you know again like ian's analogy earlier i think our audience they're you know, again they're adults even the uninitiated are smart enough to figure out and understand the importance because when you come up through decades of one at a one inch at a hundred meters or 100 yards then you hear about the the difference and then the compounding error and you're trying to figure out ballistic calculators you're trying to figure out turrets and reticles and matching all that up to to get to what ian's article is about was you know accuracy and precision it causes so much trouble for a lot of the shooters out there that are transitioning the intermediate shooter to advanced shooter that are doing longer distances um so yeah you're exactly right um i think um Again, it comes down to how do you, you know, so whatever way you as an instructor teach it now, instead of saying one inch at a hundred, say, even if you still want to stick with linear thought, trains of thought and not use the angle, uh, say 1.047. And if someone asks in and, and just explain to them why it's important that that point, point 0.047 is there uh, for longer distances. I think that anyone will understand that even a, a novice, but the, it won't be foreign to them when they hear it again later on and someone goes well that other guy told me it was only one inch why is this guy now telling me something different and it goes back to you know you know people like well this is my best holster ever because this is the only one i've ever used and what i ever heard it's kind of the same thing like well this guy must not be that smart because not and, and matt and i see this all the time in, in the gun forms people that learn something a certain way they you know that's just it's like i like a certain type of uh you know, ice cream, because all I ate was chocolate ice cream. And if they learn something a certain way, that's what they, like, the whole, uh, uh, you know, rigidity, I think, comes into learning or the ability to learn something new and accept that, uh, you know, there's something, you know, to actually factually correct or change something that might actually help them improve, become a better shooter. So if I could... Uh take advantage of the math and rounding and segue just a little bit. So uh, let's say there's a particular type of firearm part, which is quite common and uh, people like to buy them in large piles. Uh, let's say there are a number of different companies that make this particular firearm part. Let's say that 
certain companies will use uh, either tooling that is slightly off-sized or tooling that it, they use tooling past its workable life, and they combine that with a, let's say, rounding error in a program, math matters. And you wonder why your new home-built AR, you know, you can't, you can't like put the bullet feeder thing in there and have the bullet feeder thing come back out and you go, just as good, bro. Just as good. Anyway. Your Legos. You mean you wonder why your Legos don't fit together? Right. Chad's going to punch me for that. And that's actually a legit, and that's what goes to, when this speaks, what you just brought up speaks specifically to optics themselves. When you have uh, a reticle, which is a very, can be very precise. Uh, so you have a very calibrated precision uh, increments on you know, illustrated on the reticle, but then you have a lazy machinist or a machinist who rounded it up because it's easier for the manufacturing processes where they just kept it at one inch. So your reticle and your turrets are not in sync. You have a reticle that's showing you true MOA and you got reticles, or excuse me, turrets that are making adjustments in shooter's MOA. So, and that's with, again, that's not with the better scopes. So the middle, some of the middle of the line scopes, some of the lower end or cheaper scopes, you can find that. But this, still, let's just say it's a top of the line scope. And this goes into, again, this is probably a little bit further, but when you're talking about accuracy is, and you're trying to eliminate some of these variables that Ian talks about in that article is that um, there's what's called in precision, he calls it the ladder test. And you test and you take, you, you know, build the, I'm not going to go into the explanation, but basically you test out and you turn and you shoot your, your weapon through its full range of elevation and or windage to see if the increments um, that each click is supposed to represent is accurate. Because accurate. sometimes even on top end scopes, the, the adjustments can be off a little bit. Sometimes it, it depends. It's usually, usually at the far end. Sometimes it's some, somewhere in the middle. It just depends sometimes. Some scopes are off a little bit and that that when you're talking about precision and and accuracy that becomes very important um and again if you know that there's a deviation some of the better uh, ballistic software programs out there you can put that in and tell it what the difference is and it will compensate for it so um again that's probably a little bit more advanced but exactly what uh david was saying is that um sometimes you know math, looks like words matter when it comes to stuff like that, math matters. You're going to say something, Ian? Or are you just choking on your tongue again? No, it's, uh, you reminded me of, uh, you got something to say to me? I don't know, like you're like punching me through the screen or something. So um, what was I going to say? So, yes, a couple things, not really my not monumentally important but uh so back in the old day the first uh, version of the army a training circular when marksmanship was called gunfighting but apparently that was too much for the uh, uh, sensitive types at uh, big army to handle but uh i did find a little passage in the old manual that did actually specify what moa is that number over there so at least it was, you know, it was in the book at one point. And um, um, I'm not quite certain that it's not in the current book. I haven't actually looked for that number specifically. So anyway, it might still be there. It might not be. But um, talking about the vapor lock that Mike Lewis mentioned, you know, as soon as, uh, and it's definitely real, but as soon as anyone starts thinking about the words you're using, and pauses and takes an off ramp from everything else that you're saying from that point forward, you've just lost them. And it's hard to get them back on, on ramp when they missed the last 15 seconds of what you were saying. And now you're building on it and they have no idea anymore. So it's, very, it's critically important that folks don't lose their audience and get them vapor locked, like Mike was saying. I don't think anyone on the panel would think that's a good thing. Don't, don't take me that way. But uh, it, it's definitely something that um, we have to be aware of and, and moderate, so to speak. You know, throttle up, throttle back. I see um, uh, Ricky Labistre joined us, uh, even though he spent the last 
um, God knows how long away from the family. And then now he's back home and now he's like, well, I'm back, but you know, take out the trash yourself. I'm getting online with the boys. You know, and, as over there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Since, since you brought it up, I pulled up the current book. This is TC 3-22.9 change three. And I don't yep. believe this is one of the things that was changed, but Minute of Angle is in chapter three. I'm looking at paragraph 3-5 on page 3-2. Quote, one MOA equals 1.047 inches per 100 yards. Okay. So it's in there. We did change it. Okay. It's in there. For, for awesome. most applications, a soldier can round this to one inch at 100 yards or 1.1 inches at 100 meters to okay. simplify their arithmetic. Right. So it is the, point is, the point is, it's out there. And it's, it's, the onus is on instructors to go to a certain level of detail that is required for the end state in the program of instruction. If that POI, if the lesson plan doesn't call for someone to be an expert in terms like uh, scotopic, mesopic, and, and you know, what are the other fancy terms in, in, in low light courses? You know, like do they, do these end users that need to know how to use a flashlight with a, with a, with a pistol need to really understand scotopic and what that is? Maybe. But, you know, if you're trying to turn them to, you know, low-light instructors, sure. But if you're just the end user, if that's your audience, maybe not so much. Maybe it's the same thing with, you know, MOA and 1.047 versus one inch. I don't know. I'm just a dumb dumb. And there's a reason people with extra chromosomes back in the day were called mongoloids, you know, they kind of like asian -y. So maybe that's a thing. Who knows? You know, and just for clarification, I'm not, I'm not beating up Ian. Ian and I were actually just having this discussion. As, you know, we were having fun. Yeah, we have a good time. So, but I, what I would ask is any everyone on the board, though, I guess, because really at the question that Ian and I were talking about is, do we think our students, our audience is so dumb that we have to continually to con just use one inch instead of telling them mathematically, like you said, you don't have to get too deep into the weeds, but if instead of just telling them one inch, at 100, tell them it's 1.047 inches at 100, if that's what you want to do. Is anyone out here, because like you just said, we're using words like, uh, you know, myelination, scotopic, we're using, it's it's common, these all this technical and scientific use of words in the shooting industry, but yet we were afraid to, to try to explain 0 0.047 to someone because we think it's too complex. So that's my question. Is it to, you know, the panel, do you think our audience is, uh, too challenged to understand 1.047 inches at 100 if you still want to stick with inch per 100 yards uh, to understand that I have, concept. Depends I have on the one audience. Thing to input, one, one thing just to say that, that, I'll, that I'll, I promise you I'll shut the heck up and it's that there is a distinct difference between an audience that shows up taking the time away from the family, like Rick Lebistre did, spending their own money on it, wanting to be there for the instruction, and what they take out of it, or, I mean, hell, a lot of those dudes will have a notebook out, jot down things all the time. I do it all the time. I was once accused of trying to steal someone's POI because I was taking so many notes, but, you know, I'm paying for it, I'm taking notes. But then, if you're being fed a large group of dudes or dudettes, that have to be there, number one, they're not really tuned in anyway, and now you're losing them with that additional level of fidelity that they don't even care about. Um, they're forced to be there, they don't care, they're not real shooters, although ostensibly they should have an active interest in the firearm and, and their competency in, in it. It's most visible in very large organizations like the Army, where you know, you've got people that don't even think they need to know how to shoot a gun, shockingly, because you know, what do I need to do that for? I'm I'm personnel, I'm, I'm logistics, I'm supply. And bef I'll shut up in just a second. And those dinglings don't even realize that they're the number one uh, Johnny on the spot for base defense when everyone else is off. If you're a fob it, base defense is your job. You better know your machine guns. So anyway, um, it does matter what kind of organization you work for. It does matter if people are forced to be there or if they're paying to be there and, and are highly motivated to be there. And, and that I think, uh, I think there are some folks to answer the question that maybe that kind of detail, it's, 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 they, they don't, either don't care, it goes over their head, it will make them stumble and trip. And, and I think maybe some, for some folks, it's actually not. So I'll, I'll shut up now for a little while. <laughs>
Well, it completely depends on the audience, as you guys pointed out. However, that being said, in my experience, it's in the best interest of everyone to establish that baseline of this is what the information is. From there, as long as everyone understands when I say one inch, what I really mean is whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, and obviously, there are going to be those students that don't really pay attention, and then they're going to regurgitate what they thought they they thought you said. Um, that, that, those are my thoughts on it. Much, much more to the point than all these other blowhards. You guys ever seen that video of uh, yeah the the guy that that's making the bicycle turn the wrong way? You, you, you may know what I'm talking about. It's like a it's a dog on bicycle ride, and he he does a bunch of jacking around on it and makes it where when the uh, the handlebars turn right, the wheel actually turns left. So he like goofs up everything he's ever understood about riding a bicycle, right? Um, but he, he knows the, the information that needs to be known, right? He knows that if I turn the wheel left or if I turn the handlebars left, the, the wheel will go right, you know, and, and vice versa. But the brain doesn't yet understand this, right? And so what's happening is, is he's trying to ride this thing and he knows everything that, you know, he, he needs to know to be able to do it, but he doesn't fully understand it enough yet to be able to apply it. And so anyway, long story short, he, he goes through this process and finally relearns the brain's um, ability to, to be able to do that. And, um, and then he, <laughs> I think like after six months or so of a fight and trying to learn it, he's, you know, he's, he's good to go. And then he tries to go back to, uh, to what he has always known, which is the standard bicycle configuration as we know it. And he can't ride it. Uh, the, the brain has now relearned uh, a different understanding. And so even though for all his life, he, he knew how to, how to do something or he, he knew like, you know, like you guys say, you know, you know, one MOA is, is a minute of angle and that minute of angle measures 1.046 at 100 yards and increases with distance, you know, and you, un, you know, there's a big difference between understanding that and just knowing that, you know? Um, and I think you, you know, it's, it's, it's more important for you to, understand it right and be able to in, in my the way i do this is i, I visualize everything right so um I, i'm like as i'm talking about minutes of angle i'm seeing this this angle take off through space um that's the way that i, I visualize it and that's what i uh sorry over there there we go sorry uh and and as i visualize it that's what i try to, to give to students is like hey man look let me draw this out for you because this makes sense to me this way um, so on and so forth. And then it's, you know, how deep in the weeds do we go with that? Well, that's like Ian said, based on what is the, the end goal of these two days that I'm here, man, you know, like, uh, you know, you, you understand it now, how, how far do we take this and does it matter at the end of these two days? Um, so that's anyway, just a random thought, uh, backwards, backwards bicycle riding. Um, I think it is important. It, it is important because we look at, let's look macro, micro, we're, right now we're micro. But as you zoom back out, you start stacking errors. You start, you start stacking everything. So, okay, just for sake of argument, one mil is what? 3.438 minutes, right? What if my math is based on one inch at 100? And I'm looking at a thousand. Did that tolerance stacking produce an error in my minutes and my mills? Absolutely, it did. Is there a point where you can swag it? Yes. But it is incumbent on the instructor, it is the duty of an instructor to present proper and correct information to the student. What the student takes from it is on them, but it is incumbent on an instructor to present the correct information. And if you say 1.047, got it, boom. For ease of use in the field, you can round it off to one, but know that you're gonna have a tolerance stacking issue there when you get to extended distances or when you start adding multiple minutes, Okay, the student knows that, but if the student was not presented that because ah, you're good enough, that instructor just failed. 
And again, yeah. and that's not even taking into account environmentals like wind and Correct. all the other environmentals. And that was kind of what my point was with Ian. My conversation was as, as instructors, don't, shouldn't, don't, we have, don't we have the onus to give the student everything they need to succeed? Maybe not, not maybe not necessarily now, they may not get it, but later on, they'll, they'll, they'll be familiar with it, they've heard it before, and now they can understand it. Or, you know, if you tell a guy one inch and a thousand, a hundred, he's either going to get it or he doesn't, if he's, you know, motivated or not. So if you add 0 0.047, same thing, he's either going to get it or he doesn't. But at least he's heard the correct uh, information from the get-go. If I got to worry about the guy doing a green on blue incident, may want to throttle back on how much talent I give the guy. <laughs> Speaking from overseas experience of dudes shooting at me. <laughs> I don't know, maybe that's not a funny joke. Hey, hey guys, come on. Are you working? You kind of sound like you're talking yeah. in a toilet. Check, 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 check. You mean Rick does? Yeah, Rick does. Okay. This is not the greatest tablet ever. So it's, you sound okay. I'm, you got yeah. bandwidth issues too, I can tell. There's a lot of uh, jitter in your video. And yeah. Um, you might Sorry, be Yeah, sorry. No, I'm just I'm 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 setting this up. This is this is a new tablet I got, and I'm not sure if it's if it's you know really up to speed and audio is working, video. It looks like there there might be a little bit of a lag in it. So I'm just trying to get these settings right. So okay. I might have to go video to up the quality here. I'm going here from Jack Bring Lewis. Back around to where in the interview room. What but were you accused of? Any case, are they beating you up? <laughs> what was that? Do it. You can do it. You look like you're in an Jack, interview room. Like yeah, Jack Lewis like, is is getting interviewed right now. Like someone oh, needs a technique over there. Like they they've got like mutt and Jeff, you know, good cop, bad cop going on. Like what's next? Fear up harsh? Like they're gonna fucking come at you with a fucking rubber hose now? Barking dogs? Maybe. It's the way things are going, might as well. Shit, I'm just sitting there, sitting there learning, <laughs> going through it. I was like, okay, well, I'm not an expert on that, therefore I will be quiet. I don't know you. What's your background, Jack? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar. Well, I used to be a, uh, I'm current law enforcement in, uh, South Central Louisiana, and uh, for a long time prior to that, I was a hard hat diver. Were you uh, ever partnered up with uh, uh, Steven Seagal? Was he ever your uh, patrol partner? No, and they've actually, uh, they've actually, no one will come out and say it, but they've actually changed the laws in Louisiana. Um, as to how people get commissions now and the fact that if you're going to be a commission officer in the state of Louisiana, you have to go through a uh, post-certified uh, academy and nobody's calling it the Steven Seagal law, but it's basically the Steven Seagal law. And Even standards for shame standards. Gosh, dang it. <laughs> yeah. Basically. Yeah. He's, it guy's a trip. Um, but no, I, I know, but there's a lot of guys from the Jefferson Parish that have like Steven Seagal stories. This is what, what he goes around patrolling for. AUs. Um, and not getting killed <laughs> in the streets. It's my least favorite thing. My I mean, second least favorite thing one. is getting, yeah, my second least favorite thing is getting drowned in the streets. Hey, Jack, you gotta love uh, you gotta love law enforcement certification standards. Like, hey, we should be like 
Yeah. But we have the budget and the people for like, yeah, if you can do this, yeah, yeah you're probably, uh, probably, it, you probably won't need all the extra stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be fine. That's just, that's like what you said. It's like, uh, when people want to talk about training, it's like, I get it. But again, we can do that. Are you as a municipality with your tax dollars willing to pay for that? Because when they start talking about that, it's like, oh, that's when it goes, wah, wah. Yeah, so. Yeah. And hey, then, I'll put, uh, hey, Jack, I'll put this into dive terms for you. So it's like dive tables, man. Is it, hey, man, just spend about 15 minutes at that, at that depth uh, and you'll be good? Because, you know, it's generally the ballpark instead of spending the, uh, the, you know, what the dive table actually says, which is 30 minutes. Right. That, and then, that, that analogy work for you? It, oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where it's just like, um, and, and trust me again, like I can, I, I can, I can get into deep waters with that, you know, and because um, that was another one too where uh, probably – counterintuitively to a lot of people the, the most I've been affected on a dive as far as like negative physical effects was probably a, like a deepest I want was like 50 feet but it was all the going back up to get something and coming back down going up and get something passing for the through the first two atmospheres that fucked me up the worst and actually I got a friend that um, got embolized going underneath working on an aircraft carrier, the deepest he went was 50 feet. You know, it wasn't that sexy, you know, 900 foot dive that somebody thinks that we're doing out here. But yeah, no, like you said, it's, it's not just, yeah, you'll be, you'll be down there for 15 feet. Come right up. You'll be fine. It's not like that. And I can tell you when we, when we talk about, what you guys were talking about with training and whether people have to be there or they want to be there. I think it's interesting, the, the culture behind that. I mean, I've never been in the military, but with law enforcement stuff, uh, trying to teach a group of people in service training who don't want to be there, especially the ones who outrank you is rather interesting. Thanks. Well, sometimes you have that in the military as well. Um, no one really wants to do pre-jump for airborne operations. We've all done it a million times. It's the same thing. You, literally, you read it right out of the book, uh, depending on what unit you're in. But um, it's all, it's a, I think it's also, again, on the person giving the instruction. Everyone knows that they have to take a bite of the, sit, the shit sandwich. But if you're able to get them through that suck in the least painful way possible, as quickly as possible, without cutting corners or... Uh, uh, you know, accepting mediocrity, I think that's probably the best way to deal with when you have a group of people, especially like peers like that is uh, everyone knows what's good. You know, they could probably get up there and teach the class just like you could as well, maybe better sometimes, but if you can, you know, get it out, get it in there and get it, uh, be technically and tactically correct and make it as painless as possible. That's usually the best in my experience, at least the way to, to t tackle something like that. Painlessly definitely. as possible, Scott. Painlessly? As possible? Painlessly as possible, yes. Yeah, that, that, that's a big deal, too. Why? And this also goes back to the, what Ian started with, um, talking about, you know, the, the earth is a sphere. No, it's not quite. But in all this, you know, specificity is a thing. And, and I think everybody here would agree. Specificity is a thing. Words mean things. You should use the correct terminology. But there are times that you can use general vernacular, like Ian was talking about, you know, muscle memory versus myelination. And, and that's a matter of knowing your audience. Does everybody know what you're talking about when you say, you know, X? And, and Scott, you brought up pre-jump. It's... You, or you jump master qualified by chance? Yes, sir. Static line and halo. Okay, only static line for me. But you know, we went through we went through JM school, and it was 
<laughs> as you're doing your your JMPI per grade, it's you know correct nomenclature, correct placement on the jumper's body, all of this, you know, <laughs> it's you know, <laughs> oh my God. And if you didn't get the correct nomenclature with the correct placement on the jumper's correct side, you just failed. But what happens when you get down to green ramp and you're doing JMBI? You see something wrong and you call a parachute rigger and are you worried about nomenclature? No, you point at that piece of equipment or that item of equipment and say, fix that. And the, the parachute rigger knows what you're talking about. And it's, it's one of those things where you have to have effective communication Oh, yeah, I, I agree completely with that. You have to tailor your instruction to your audience, but at the same time, like what, again, this is, this, and this is, again, talking specifically to Ian's article there, with, which is about precision and accuracy. So it's an assumption at that point that, or it's implied that, that we're talking about not a beginner or an uninitiated person. This is someone who's looking at, probably it's intermediate looking at improving precision and accuracy. So in that, in, in that's the context I'm kind of talking too, as far as this, but you're exactly right. If you got a, a bunch of knuckle draggers uh, and it's not really important for them to know that, you don't have to go into that level of detail. But um, which I agree, that gets the whole thing that Ian let in with about, you know, with this Neil deGasse analogy. Um, but with his, with this article and what he was talking about and what we decided to talk, you know, what Ian and I were talking about was specifically uh, at what, you know, at what point is it, is it on the onus of the instructor to put this out to the students? And are our students, do we do in this day and age, do we still believe our students are incapable of understanding that, you know, everything after the decimal point? And that was kind of, uh, you know, what, that, what you know, Ian and I were like, this is, you know, let's, let's talk about this. And that's really kind of what the question, you know, we're, you know Ian and I are bringing up is, What's everyone's thought about this? Is it, you know, not talking about, you know, yeah, we get it. You got to teach to your audience, but is, is it, I mean, is it too much to ask to talk about what comes after the decimal point or just even mention it in, you know, in everyone's opinion? No, you I, owe I it to them. Right. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. I mean, as, as long as you frame it in the context of uh, what's important to know and when, uh, what what are you trying to do and what can you get away with and when can you uh, basically get, get by with a, letter, a lesser amount of precision and when do you actually need it? I, th I think just as long as you frame it in the context of this is what is important and if I can get you to understand that there are times when it is more important to know that decimal and there are times when it is not. If you understand capabilities and limitations of your weapon, the equipment you're working with, the situation, everything's going to, the context of it is going to dictate what level of precision you need. So if, if I give you the tools to understand that, like, hey, I need a greater level of precision, I need, to, I need that little uh, bit after the decimal in order to make this happen, or, hey, this situation doesn't call for that level of precision, I don't need it. If I can get you to understand the context and when it's really needed, that to me is the the, the greater success. Yeah, can I, you know, blast your brain with all kinds of technical mumbo jumbo and you'll never retain it, possibly. Can I dumb it down to the point where I'm, you know, uh, shortchanging you? Probably. But I think the ideal situation is getting you to understand what the context is, which each one will be needed and going from there. And if I can get that, that's that's the optimal situation that I'm going to be striving for. Will it always happen with you know everyone depending on your audience? Like like was said, no, but that should be the goal, I believe. If the accuracy of your information is going to affect the accuracy of the gun, you probably need to have accurate information. I like that. Yes, Ian, you raise your hand. And we have Paul no. on, who hasn't been on forever. Paul Who's Gardner. Paul? Paul Gardner. You don't so, know Paul Gardner? No, I don't know Paul Gardner. Everyone knows Paul Gardner. Is he the Gardner of Gardner? Paul, 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 
This is old school. We got we got Darren up there. We got Paul over here. Is Paul the the dude that sued Tennessee, as in V Tennessee? Uh, you know, no. Man. Hey, what's up, Paul? Rick and his dialogue. <laughs> Rick's got net zero. He's got this, like <laughs> this is like episode six that's that's about to be re-released. Modcast six from February twenty first, I think, of sixteen. Everyone sounds like R two D two. If someone if someone like Chuck can have decent internet and the ability to stream, no one else has an excuse. Yeah, Rick. He does have twenty kids though, and they all have their own devices. Yeah, yeah it's the the bandwidth. <laughs> Sounds like something a communication guy would say. Sunspots. Bandwidth. I would turn off your video, dude, and just go audio. Because we yes. don't want to look at you anyway. Oh, bullshit. That's the only reason anybody comes here. As long as we... Never mind. Hey, at least <laughs> Ian's still wearing clothes. <laughs> so, yeah, Paul's like an old-school OG modcast guy. We spent okay. hours late at night talking about all kinds of stuff. That was bad. How are we all getting shit faced? Well, you guys were, but you're married now and respectable. Exactly. I'm even chewing nicotine gum instead of having a big old fat dip of Copenhagen. I've also seen you've been doing a ton of training. Yeah, uh, got back into it and nice. uh, getting ready to start doing the teaching thing on my own as well. So nice. looking forward to that. Yeah. Good time. Speaking of teaching, did everyone see that article on water.com? Yeah, I think that's a great topic because one of the yes, people is. involved is someone I've been told by multiple reputable sources to avoid like the plague. So the title for Yollins, love that word, by the way, stole it from a guy named Steve back east. Uh, it's on Wired.com. Uh, the title is, uh, I am not a soldier, but I have been trained to kill. And the subparagraph or subtitle is, a sprawling tactical industry is teaching American civilians how to fight like special ops forces by preparing for violence at home. Are they calling it into being? Question mark. So anyway, if you've not seen it, uh, it posted a published yesterday. What day is today? P published on the 15th. So yesterday. Check it out. They've got um, dudes from Gunsight on there. They've got... Um, some organization called Green Eye Tactical. Who had a, Bush. he made an article basically, so he outlawed, or outlawed uh, Aimpoint T1s from his classes because of parallax. Then he wrote a paper where basically, it's like he took a bunch of words and just kind of sprinkled them that don't quite fit. <laughs> Monkey on a typewriter, yeah. that kind of thing. And so a lot of right, people so then, got this article and they went, oh yeah, this is great stuff. And then if you read it and you know what you're looking for, it's like, yeah, this isn't good stuff. No. And he's the guy, yeah, no, not touching him with a 10-foot so, pole. So gun sites, uh, they, apparently the author visited gun sites. Um, Paul Howe is mentioned, although uh, they didn't actually link up with the dude. Um, who else is in here? That's, that's the, the gist of the article is that everyone's getting tactical training. And that uh, is it something to be concerned about? And uh, I, the timing is interesting with the election because this took some time to develop and write. It wasn't overnight. Um, and and I sense that the big crush is coming. And it, it, we, I, I don't know what to make of this. It's just interesting times we're living in. Check out that there's, article. There's well, a couple things on that 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 article fails to mention. Number one. Well, I'm sure. It's just that the, the, the vibe in the industry is just, or, or not the industry, the vibe in the population is looking at us with a, with a side eye right now. And, and we got a, we've got, I, I don't know how this is going to play out. It's going to be hundred percent agree. But what people need to understand, and most of the people who read that article and had their, oh my God, yeah, moment are not going to hear this statement. And if they do hear this statement, they're not going to give a shit. But what people need to understand is being trained to handle a gun and run your gun and hit your targets in an expeditious manner is a whole lot different from being trained for combat because, you know, there's a thing called collective tasks. There's a thing called small unit tactics. 
and you know military does it law enforcement does it it's a different application in both worlds but you got dudes with radios that are going to come to assist you when you get into it get into a pretty bad event and in some scenarios you got dudes flying aircraft that have explosive devices strapped to the bottom of them and they're going to come swoop in and drop those explosive devices off the bottom of them just because you've been trained to handle a gun doesn't mean you're you're getting trained like a soft dude so that author <laughs> yeah and then there's the other side especially a gun site mind you i just want to throw that out whatever no personal experience at gun sites so don't know but there's the other side of that it is the responsibility it is your it's your responsibility as an american because if we look all the way back to the Militia Act of, I think it was 1791, all able-bodied male citizens from the ages of 17 to 45 were part of the militia. And they were saddled with the responsibility of keeping a serviceable firearm and ammunition for said firearm. Yeah, the times have changed, but the current legislation in federal law stipulates that if you're a male between certain ages, you are a member of the unorganized militia. Hmm. Well, unfortunately we have these companies that, and these individuals that are doing anything they can to get attention, anything they can to get business. And some of them have decided to put together an experience where people can dress up and it's not training, it's dress up. It's, it's pretending to be something. Um, unfortunately, in some of these low information gun groups, people are big on this, this, they want this experience, but not training. And the minute you bring up someone like Tim Heron, they deny, they, 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 they say, no, that's, that's stupid. I don't want to train with a, uh, with a um, person who competes. Well, who, who do the, the, the top tier units train with? They train with people like Tim Heron. I don't need to train with uh, special forces, whatever, to learn how to carry a gun. Sure, it's fun. I have trained, I've trained with those kinds of guys. I've trained with those companies. The companies I've worked with, though, aren't providing a dress-up experience. We, we yeah, train and to, 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 to learn our weapons and, and, yeah, Dave? Yeah, and, like, you know, your average person, they aren't going to go, bad things are happening, push button send me friends with more guns you know i have this to talk on versus a lot of people if they play with radios they have something like this you push the button on this and say send friends people are going to be like what the heck are you talking about and i see a lot of people who play dress up have like these you know cheapo type uh ham you know hts versus i push the button on this and say send friends and everyone who can hear is coming because we're being paid to go toward where the bad stuff is. So, you know, it's, it's fun to have tactical band camp, but like you're saying, it's, you know, the, the mechanics of stuff and the basics of stuff is, is more important. How to be, how to be efficient and accurate is more important than how to go play Lone Ranger. That's one of the reasons I, I brought up, um, to, uh, gun sight. Uh, as well as because uh, although at one time they were actually you know teaching some special operations people there and in, in military and everything nowadays you know if that writer would have gone to some other <laughs> other facilities where everyone is all decked out multicam and they are all civilians you know it, it uh, could have been a lot different but I've also always kind of looked at it just from everything I've seen since uh, you know, my time, I guess past 11 years now that I've, you know, been training my ass off and seeing so many other people and seeing past few years, a lot of people that paying more attention to martial artists and stuff like that is that the, basically the better and more efficient you are at, at violence and violent acts, the, the less violent of a person you, you are unless it's like legit self-defense because the more you learn how bad things can go as well for one reason, but also legally you don't want to lose the right to carry a gun and all that stuff. So Andy Fisher just said in chat, even though he's actually here in the podcast, everyone wants to take a T triple C course 
when it has almost zero applicability for civilians. Kind of sounds like the same thing too. Maybe that's a topic we need to talk to talk about next. Bunch of bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and if you yes. don't know who Andy Fisher is, you probably need to look him up. Because he's the, one of those guys when he talks about stuff, you probably need to listen because he talks about the stuff he knows about. Are you Steve's daddy? Steve's my daddy. Oh. Hey. Dude, speaking you know, of speak like of not training with a bunch of bunch of uh, like fucking ultra tactical ninjas, man, I, I had a pretty cool last couple days. Uh, took a JJ Rakaza class. Oh, yeah, yeah, band camp. See, and I can't imagine his yeah, class was a, good time, is a man. bunch of dress uh, up. A lot of cool fish. Yeah, yeah I, I bet that was just focused on all. performance. Absolutely. Um, um, you know, and it was, it was, it was performance in whatever arena you wanted to take it in, you know, without like trying to get super into the weeds. I mean, he, you know, he'll tailor his, his instruction in terms of, you know, like he says, straight up, he's not teaching you tactics, like, like most really good instructors that are not trying to get in, you know, trying to, I don't want to even say stay in their lane, but focus on something that is, that is, you know, more broadly applicable, but you know, yes, is is he a quote unquote gamer? Of, well, yeah, of course. But I mean, the the level of efficiency and human performance that that he has achieved. I mean, he knows a thing or two about doing that. And yes, he does teach things that that have been proven. And you know, it, it's it, it was it was a great class. I mean, just learning efficiencies that that I mean, down to one and two foot movements and things like that. It was. You know, it, it's it's absolutely awesome, and it, it, yes, there's plenty of crossover. But again, like any other class, it's like dude, you got to know where to apply it and where not to. You know, and people try to paint things with a broad brush, and you know, we we beat the shit out of this dead horse. But still, at the same time, it's still happening, and, and people say, ah, oh, that doesn't, that's not tactical. It's like, dude, apply it where it needs to be applied. Don't apply it where it doesn't need to be applied. It's it's that fucking simple. Most well, people don't need tactical anyway. Yes, uh, yes. Tactical's overused. Oh, yeah. I hate that well, word. I fucking hate that it's, word. It's, a lot of people confuse technical and tactical and, and where each has its place. And I think it comes down to – it dovetails nicely with the conversation I had recently. This, this, we used it earlier, TTP. What's the TTP? Tactic, Technique, Procedure. I asked one of my Joes what that – what, it, what the difference, what those words meant. And they actually didn't know, of course, military definition versus, you know, other definitions might, might vary a little bit, but uh, just to recap it. So, you know, again, words mean things like Mike said, uh, tactic is a, uh, the employment and ordered arrangement of forces in relation to each other. That's a tactic. Technique is like, in, uh, like a step-by-step -step process to do something it's not mandatory. It's not prescriptive. In other words, it's descriptive. You can do it this way. You can do it another way. And then um, procedure. It, it is done uh, prescriptively. It must be done in a particular way every single time because it speeds uh, communication, like a nine-line medevac or like call for fire typically. Typically, I've seen it. Oh, that's, anyway, but, but so tactic, technique, I've seen, and, and multicam. I heard, I think it was Paul talking about people show up in multicam or someone said that. I have seen friends, SF dudes, show up at uh, shooting courses and they show up in cowboy boots and jeans and a t-shirt and they look like they just rolled out of bed. Meanwhile, they're standing next to some dude in his, you know, full-on multicam everything who, you know, like you said, it's, it's band camp. It's, 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 hey, it's their getaway. You know, nothing I'll, wrong with that. But I'll, I'll have you know, I was sick this week. And while I was sick at home in bed, I was wearing my nice cry multicam pants <laughs> and a nice Patagonia. Seriously. I don't have you use for it normally. Because you were crying? Because you're a big baby? Yes. 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 Okay. It was comfy, though, because those are comfy pants, but I don't use them for much of anything. I've heard those pants are really a good at absorbing all the tears you cry, knowing yes. that you'll never be as cool as the people yes. who blast dudes with belt feds wearing them. That's true. Man, I'll rock my dad shorts all day. Stretchy, breathable, all that good stuff. <laughs> well, it's cold over here.
Rick, you look like you lost weight. You look like you know that, or your whole outfit was made out of space. And you were wearing some like sleek, like I don't know what you were wearing, but you were looking pretty. You were looking pretty uh, svelte. svelte. Yep. Yes, svelte. Yeah. No, man, I, I I haven't lost weight. I haven't found weight. But Spanx. Okay. Got I it. did score some. Uh, yeah, exactly. I scored some like thirteen dollar like stretchy uh, uh, snivel. Um, compression tops and bottoms because you know there's a lot of movement uh, obviously in that class a lot of it's based on movement and stuff and you know just running around i, I hate running around in, in pants and and just you know you, we're running and gunning and stuff so like a lot of the a lot of the weapons manipulation like magra loads and shit like that whatever you, rocking my nice comfy hoodie isn't gonna work so yeah it's it's yeah it's like my gamer gear but you know whatever it also is very comfortable to sleep in, so I might be doing that too. That's why I say multiple, see multiple days of me wearing the same thing. It's probably because I did. Basically, it's yoga pants. That's what you're telling me. You're wearing yoga pants. The, the man yoga pants with dad shorts over it. Can't lose. And that's why I don't go to gamer classes, because you start dressing like them. You start shooting like that's them. Great. You start cheating like them. Get the fuck out of here. And you know what, Steph? Like, People, say, egg, SF, egg. Uh, people don't realize SF dips their finger in a, a wide variety of pools or t- dips their toe, yeah. their finger. Is it a magwell? I don't know. I said that for you, Ben Sandy. But um, like back in the back in the eighties, they take Evelyn Wood speed reading. Remember Evelyn Wood? They would take speed reading. They take lock picking classes from locksmiths. They take driving classes. Does that mean my locksmith is a, a tactical dude? No, it doesn't mean that at all. But I'm sure they probably know how to sew tactical gear like our friend down there scratching his head right now. There you are. Um, they, 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 they know how to do a lot of different things. So just because they, I don't know. I'm so, babbling. No, you, so I mean, so oh, I, I, being the SF guy here, I can, I can actually speak this. And this is always cracks me up. Matt could probably relate to this more than anything because we're always trying to set people on the right path in some of these gun forms. Is there always someone will be like, you know, throw something out and they'll be like, okay, Mr. Operator, you know, <laughs> special. And I'm like, well, you know, you're actually, I, I, I am that guy. I can honestly say that. I know this is the internet and everyone says they are, but you really are talking to someone that does this and, and no, we don't do that. Or yes, we, you know, this is how we do it. Um, that whole argument again, about you know, competition and, uh, you know, tactics and, and uh, getting killed in the street, that whole argument, that dead horse, uh, um, dude, uh, we brought in Rick, uh, Rick Latham brought, I, I traveled with, uh, Jerry Barnhart. Um, like you said, I've, I've had locksmiths come in. We've had special people that are experts in what they do. And one of the big things I always remember is, you know, again, Jerry Barnhart out in his range in his backyard and we're talking and he's like, Hey man. I don't teach tactics. That's you guys. You guys do that. I, I teach you how I, I'm here to teach you about shooting. And he's the, probably one of the first instructors I heard actually just come out and say that. And he's exactly right. He goes, he goes, I can't tell you anything about tactics that, I mean, you, you guys don't already know or haven't done for real, but I can show you how to shoot really, really good. Uh, and he, and he can, and he, they're exactly right. They're so that people that like, well, competition and all, dude. You take what you need, you learn it, you 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 just absorb all that stuff, and you bring the best people in, and you you put it to work. Um, like I said, eat we, the meat and spit out the bones, man. That's always been my philosophy. Yeah, I mean, you know, same way with like, you know, this goes back into training and practices. People are like, well, um, I don't care if it's tennis, football, uh, a singer. You know, someone's talking about something and they're like, well, so-and-so, you know, he's natural or he's, you know, he's a good singer or he's good at doing X. A lot of those professionals, that, whether it's singing, acting, uh, shooting, whatever it is, they've got people that coach them. And it's not because those people are great. Like, like so I've worked with some celebrities doing executive protection and probably you guys probably have all heard some music. Some of the people I've, I've worked with. And they're, I mean, world famous, have, you know, whether you like their voice or their music or not, but they're professionals and they get, make a lot of money doing it. And guess what? 
they all have fucking coaches or someone that comes in and helps them perfect. Whether even it's you know playing a guitar, playing an instrument, someone who like totally shreds, they still sometimes go and you know go back to someone who's a coach or a trainer and helps them do what they do even better or tunes them up. And same way, man, you know, we go to people that are the best at training or doing whatever the task is. If it's if it's widgets, we'll find you know we'll find the best widget guy out there and bring him in and he'll t teach us about widgets but he's not we're not going to him for tactics i often uh, point out uh, mike tyson so back in the day on our like there's an argument he, he, he was like the guy he, he was iron mike tyson still is you see that fight jesus um but who was his coach custom auto like he, he's not he's not the guy in the ring you know he's not the world's best boxer obviously at that point but He's the guy that Mike Tyson went to. So anyway, making that point. And to your idea, Mr. Scott Wolf. Uh, so I have one of the, it's cleared. Um, but um, the manual, it, it says I'm an operator. So, you know, I, I'm an operator too. Just yeah, you yeah. should throw that out there next time. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to call you Ian the Operator T. <laughs> no, thank you. So Ian... Just to change the subject just slightly, you're not familiar with Paul. You're not familiar with Darren. We probably need to have some official, even though it's been years, official introductions from these two. Because everyone else has been on Jerry. recently. So who, I, I think alphabetical order by first name would put Darren first. Hey, what's up, Ian? This is Darren. I'm in Colorado. And as you guys probably have seen over the last hour or so, I've just been uh, dorking around building some uh, some gear here, as well as some prototypes for some law enforcement folks out on the East Coast. So just been uh, been here for going on 17 years in the TAC world industry and 30 plus years altogether um, with outdoor equipment and such. So uh, during the day, I play project manager at a major defense company. And at night, I play sewing machine operator. So that's about all I can describe right now. <laughs> so if there was a product that everyone knows or products, what would they be that they didn't know that came from you? Uh, the, the Maxpedition. <clears throat> yeah. Maxpedition had several of my uh, products in their SKU line back in the mid two thousands. Um, some of them are still being sold and, and resold under different labels. And then also I developed the original D three CR uh, chest rig concept for uh, Haley strategic um, and then also I do a lot of, uh, custom, uh, gear designs for folks that they can't get from like a big box store. Do you have a website that we can go check out? Uh, you know, it's extremegearlabs.com, but most of my, uh, information change and all that has been, uh, pushed to my, uh, Instagram account. Um, usually I would update, uh, projects as they're coming along, uh, typically, uh, daily. Um, like for example, I just finished off a, uh, a prototype, um, less lethal munitions carrier, uh, that's compatible with velocity armor, uh, packages and such. And during your guys' discussion on MOA and all that, I built, uh, two M18, uh, smoke can, uh, CS can carrier pockets that attach to that, uh, directly. So you have that capability as well. Um, so it's just, uh, designing on the fly and, you know, this is basically my creative outlet for folks and, uh, I like doing good things for good folks. And Paul, I did get your email and all that, and I am working on that project. Oh, that's a small world. And it's also uh, Darren's fault that I have a, an AK project occurring right now because he has such a cool little, what would you call, consider it a crank? Yeah, uh, SBR uh, uh, AK-74. Yeah. That I had built up back in 2006, and that was as a, back in the good old days of, you know, when you can get a Bulgarian parts kit for like two ninety nine out of a sportsman's guide and all that. So I took that uh, parts kit and had somebody build it into a, an SBR for me. And, and, and yeah, I, uh, well, I'm, I'm just going to blame Gary Hughes that I have multiple parts kits coming right now for multiple <laughs> types of builds. Nice. And I will finally have something close to what you have. Cause they're cool. Jump on my Instagram and you'll see pictures of that. Oh, yeah. So is that extremegearlabs.com? Yeah, extremegearlabs.com and then Instagram.com uh, slash extremegearlabs. Oh, I don't do that. 
So it, w- it was basically an alternative mode of d- just delivering pictures to folks who wanted to see stuff on their uh, cell phones, uh, namely law enforcement folks who didn't want to be on Facebook and what have you. But uh, I'm basically a one man shop here. So I'm building gear and trying to get pictures and stuff taken up and, and interfacing with uh, customers and clients. And, and then all the while taking time to brew coffee. So, yeah. And respond to emails from the most awesome, amazing, me, arguably handsome man in the world. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, Paul. <laughs> yeah, I had uh, uh, my wheelchair, my pouch, and my wheelchair is uh, my front pouch is uh, aging, and I need a new one. So I uh, hit up Darren. So hopefully we're uh, gonna do something together. But yeah, uh, Paul Gardner. Uh, used to be on here all the time back in the, the OG days. Uh, it's funny. I was on my way somewhere. I listened to one that, that you put up recently, Matt, I think it was like number five, episode four or five. Yeah. And I was just like, Whoa, what's going on here? And I'm just like, wait, Roland just check. Like, why does he, why doesn't Chuck just have his name? And, yep. uh, and I was like, oh, this is freaking old school. I, I kind of, it took me like 10 minutes to figure it out. And I was like, oh yeah, no shit. Hey, what am I doing on there? What the hell? Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Paul Gardner, I'm a former U.S. Marine, uh, joined in 2001, just after 9-11 and got wounded in Iraq during the initial invasion from Kuwait to Baghdad in the city of, Al- city of Al-Taramaya back in 2003 in April, uh, shot uh, under the armpit and went to my body and blew out my spine uh, at T12L1, so I'm paraplegic and didn't know a lot. Uh, well, didn't know that I didn't know, but I didn't know that I didn't know a lot about what I didn't know, something like that. Anyways, I didn't know shit, and I thought I did, though. Uh, the confidence that you get as a Marine just from boot camp on, I mean, they got their marketing down pretty, pretty good. Uh, it's a double-edged sword, though, because whenever you try and prove some of those theories, it, it doesn't work out so well necessarily. Uh, a lot better now, but not where it needs to be. Um, but I didn't even know how many mistakes I had made until I went to my first carbine class with Jeff Gonzalez back in like 2009. Yeah, not 11, 2009, actually. And just every course of fire, I was just like, how did I not know this? How did I not know that? What's a tactical reload? What's a speed reload? and just all that jazz and started telling my story eventually in classes and now I've told it a million times, uh, especially to uh, cops anytime there's any copper in class or even if it's an open enrollment civilian class, if they're like squared away good, good dudes, then I'll go ahead and tell it. Um, just because it's not the funnest story to tell. You're talking about, you know, one of the worst days of my life and uh, talking about failure, which is not an easy thing to talk about as a man. But, you know, I'll tell as many times as, as possible. Did a podcast on it years ago as well. So that's uh, still up, I'm sure. And, yeah, so just got into the training thing a decade or so ago. And uh, last year started my uh, LLC, Strive Tactical. Uh, don't check for that website because it ain't there yet. <laughs> a lot of administrative bullshit that I learned is not the fun part of uh, teaching that I still need to get done, but I'm looking forward to it though. So I just, I don't know, I think I'm on class, I think I hit class 110. Um, I forgot whose class I even was last, but uh, so yeah, that's what I love to do. Well, I appreciate yep. your sacrifice, man. I was about to say my pleasure, but uh, my, my honor. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And so you were in episode, oh no, you were in many before that, but when, 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 he, uh, when we had one specifically about you, that was episode 21. So right now I'm going to be releasing episode six next week. So in a few weeks, cool. 21 will be cycled back whole. And those are nice. so much fun to listen to. I, I forgot how much fun we had and how the audio absolutely sucked. Kind of like Rick's audio right now. <laughs> I stay on that dial-up, baby. <laughs> there is a lot of good knowledge, though, man. That, that yeah, uh, rock that AOL. What's up and with is, Andrew Fisher there? Sorry, so, sorry, Matt. Oh, do you know Andrew? I don't know Andrew. You don't know or, or Andy? Bro, everyone knows Andy. I don't know. No, I'm a dopey guy, though. But yeah, you are. 
Tell me about yourself, Andy. Before I got to talk about myself. This is like speed dating. It is. Where, what are your... <laughs> I'm going to turn off all the other panels just so you two are up. What, what are you wearing? So creepy. Oh, you don't want to know, Mike. No, we don't want to know that with Ian. He will strip no. tease again. I've done it. And then, and then insult injury, Matt over here. You're on this side of me, Matt. So I don't know if you're over there, Mike. No, okay. Matt over here edits the stinking mod, the, the video. You don't see anything of my, my, my junk, but the, the dopey guy that he is goes out of his way to make the world's smallest, thinnest little black bar over, you know, where my, my junk would be or should be or people think. And like put that on there, like, yes, that's all I took to cover him. So, and no one would character. notice it otherwise. <laughs> you signed the waiver, Ian. <laughs> all footage can be used however we please. Oh my God! So yeah, it reminds me of uh, first night in Marine boot camp. I'm in the army now, or kind of. I'm in the guard. Um, you signed the motherfucking contract. So yeah, Matt, you can do anything you want with it, I guess. Yes. So Andy, it's your turn to do your speed date thing. I don't, I don't uh, do a very good job at this. Uh, I'm just a knuckle dragger who uh, been in the army for God 26 years now, and uh, I was an infantry dude. And then I decided that I didn't want to be infantry and I wanted to do medicine. So I became a paramedic and then I went to PA school and I said, I'm tired of being a PA. I want to be a doctor. So now I'm a surgery intern. And so I'm an intern uh, here at the uh, University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, which is a gunner knife club, if you've ever been to Albuquerque. And uh, still in the guard but trying to go back on active duty here soon. Uh, and I, I do a few other things, but I, I've been a part of this for probably three or four years now. Yeah. For, uh, this is probably about 18. Somewhere it's been around. a couple years. Yeah, it's, it's been a few years. Uh, though I'm not very active because, uh, uh, you know, medical school. and then <laughs> What an excuse. It's only medical school. It's not like it takes up any time. But uh, I'm also on um, uh, the Committee for Tiger Combat Casualty Care. Uh, so uh, all those guidelines that come out and people like to talk about. Uh, and then I feel like uh, half the conversations I have on social media belong on um, the subreddit, Don't You Know Who I Am? Uh, because I get talked down to and called an idiot half the time. It's entertaining. Well, we've seen all the videos. So really, you know, really? That's, that's all we need, right? Yeah, you're good. And you have a TED Talk on tourniquets? I do. I have a TED Talk. I have a TED Talk on hemorrhage control. And I have a TED Talk or a, um, another talk that I did, the Pat Tillman Leadership Summit on the same, that same thing. But anyways, yeah. Your tourniquet one is one I have on rotation at my PD. Every couple months, I'll send it out to everyone and say, watch this. I appreciate Take it. Take notes. That's, yeah. you know, I appreciate that you have it available. I have no thumbs down yet on my TED talk, so don't say that. If I go with one, when I when I fail out of residency, I will be able to go no thumbs down on my TED talk. That's right. Yeah. Much so more. you were a Ranger PA. Yeah. Yeah. What I spend uh, my enlisted time there as a Eleven Bravo, and then uh, went back as PA. So like uh, twelve, thirteen years in regiment. Now I'm just broken. But you want to go back active? I'd like to. We'll see. We'll see how that works out, man. I'm not going back to regiment. I'm definitely way too old and broke to go back to regiment. And and as a surgeon, you don't want to get a regiment, man. It's, that's meant for like emergency medicine doctors and, and primary care docs who who don't need to um, stay in the operating room to maintain their skill because you don't want to a guy operating on you who's been hanging out with, you know, dudes on the line, you know, putting on tourniquets. Hey guys, look what happens when I put my finger here. <laughs> so what you're saying is you want to, you want to live in, in the world of mash. No, no, I don't know if that's the right answer either, man. I don't, I don't know about that, but uh, somewhere in between. There are plenty of um, 
plenty of places to go that aren't uh, that aren't sitting in a hospital and uh, are not you know kicking doors in. Yeah. Yeah. So who else do we have that we haven't? I don't know if Scott's know. done an intro in years, but yes, Ian. I want to know about that sexy Paul Dugan guy. Is he is he a new guy? What, what's his story? Yeah, that's true. He hasn't said anything. Does he know that he can unmute? Is, is, isn't he like the fresh meat to the primary and secondary, like behind the scenes family? So I sent him a message saying, "Dude, where are you? We're waiting for you." Just giving him a hard time. I I, I guess he thought I was serious. I'm going to guess he doesn't know how to unmute. Oh, there he is. There's his video. There, there we are. Long time listener, uh, first time caller. Yes. Yeah, you got me pretty good on that one, Matt. Well, it's, it that, doesn't, doesn't take What's much. your background there, Paul? Tell us about yourself. Oh, well, he has a ceiling fan. And and... And... Yeah, my background, that's my door. Um, Joined the Army, active duty about 21 years ago now. Left active duty in October of 2002. I left uh, 10th Mountain. I had been there for three years because I was a young soldier and thought I had missed my chance to deploy. So I left active duty, joined the National Guard immediately, and a year later got deployed. So I just realized I had to join the National Guard to get the point. So, um, been in the Iowa National Guard since 2002. And in the CAV, I know there's plenty of, you know, hate out there for the CAV, but. Not for uh, blowers. CAV Not Scout for my whole life. career. Right, right, yep. Old, uh, old CAV Scout there, although, I mean, I'm no. You all keep Cav. telling us that if we ain't Cav, we ain't shit. So we're kind of taking it to heart. And Ash. Yeah, oh yeah Ash too. Yeah, there's a few of us out there. But uh, nobody's in perfect. 2012, right? I uh, switched over to take over the state marksmanship program for the Iowa National Guard. And other than going back to the Cav, to uh, get some platoon sergeant time in between there. I've been running the marksmanship program ever since and pretty involved with uh, National Guard marksmanship. So how much influence do you think you have with all the people that are gonna be coming in from the Guard for the training summit in September? Um, mm, I guess, what do you mean by influence? So if we sat down to figure out how do we fine tune the courses and the blocks that are going to be offered to benefit you guys more, would you be someone that should be part of that discussion? Yeah. Yeah, that'd be good. Because I know I, I spoke to Miller about that. Yep. So, yeah. Because we're getting to that time. I'm starting to fill out the, uh, the schedules. And last, last year was just so much fun. It was such a good time with so many good people. Was. And, and Ian wasn't there, and it was so much, so much. <laughs> it was wonderful, yeah. So you invite Paul to oh, yeah. and Miller, and what about? Well, they were both at the event. You, you were too cool to go. You had to go to like a competition or something. I'm kind of a big deal, you know. <laughs> Not a big deal. You got articles out and everything. <laughs> That's right. You're writing articles. It's your face, Paul. No one likes you. Did we cover enough with uh, that? Speaking of articles, the article about uh, people learning how to kill like a soldier. Do we dis did we well, discuss what are you, that? What are you talking about? Did so we discuss that to the gay. level that we wanted to? What are you talking about? Killing soldiers, what? Go kill like one. No, you don't want to do that. You don't. You want to do better than that. Okay. 
We have trained them incorrectly on purpose. <laughs> That's right. No, you're right. Wired... All these civilians incorrectly on purpose. Be like, yeah. You know, you know what? Don't even worry about bringing the gun to the fight. Just trust me. You'll be fine. That kind of reminds me of an old Steve Martin stand-up routine, teaching a kid how to talk wrong. And then when he finally comes out to, to public school or whatever, it's just hilarious. We've got challenges. Again, large institutions. You could have the greatest program of instruction, the best lesson plan. And then once, once it, it's all personality driven, it really is. You can have the best thing on paper, but it's the folks on ground delivering it, what they bring to it. It, it really matters. And, and it, 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 I don't know. I'll leave it at that. What do you so think, the, Paul? Is that true? Dugan? The last part was broken. Say that again. So, are you not encountering the phenomena that you could have the best thing on paper, instructionally speaking, program of instruction, training support package, lesson plans, all details laid out, but it's the person delivering it, the one conducting it, executing it, supervising it, that if they're not bringing the heat, you can have the best recipe in the world, but, you know, like, like I say, my mom, you know, I could give a recipe to my mom to make an apple pie and give the same one to some, you know, with someone else and, and, you know, a crack head on the street and same recipe, same inputs, but it just does not come out the same. And, um, no, yeah, absolutely. Trying to generate a, a depth of skill and knowledge across a, a huge swath of a population. It's just very difficult to get done. Um, you know, you, you basically take the uh, telephone game and how far along does it have to be passed before that's not the original message that was sent out to start with. And that's, that's a lot of, especially the talks that we've had lately and, and the things you've put out about, you know, passing along uh, slide decks, and especially within the Army, you know, uh, just last week I already had, you know, people reaching out, hey, uh, you got this presentation on this, and you know, I, I could give somebody the presentation, but it's not gonna be the same class. So what we're talking about is people reaching out and asking for a slide deck or a presentation on any topic, fill in the blank. We see it commonly in the firearm side of the house, in, in, in the Army and in, in the National Guard specifically. I see it across the Army as a whole, where they ask for a slide deck on I don't know, the M4 or the M17 or something to teach PMI. And um, these people just regurgitate and a product that they didn't make, they didn't validate, they just take it and they read it and they're not actually doing the, the attendee in any benefit. And people are trying to fake the funk, but you know, we all know when someone's faking it and there, there just doesn't seem to be that depth and breadth of knowledge in the individual trainer anymore, that, that passion, that, 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 that competence, that expertise to, you don't even need a slide deck. It, they, they just annoy me to no end slide decks in general. I don't, I don't, I don't share that. I, we, we don't, we don't institutionally provide them in, in California Army National Guard. We don't. So similar to Paul Dugan, I'm uh, an assistant state marksmanship coordinator for the California Army National Guard. Um, and uh, anyway, it's, it's just people get upset with me when I tell them I don't have a slide deck to give them. Like you can't read a book, it's free. It's, it's a free download. Anyone can download this darn book, just read the damn thing. Anyway, it's just a frustration that we have, Paul and I, and, and other. So yeah, something I'm gonna do is have, Ian, I'm developing a slide deck that I will give out when asked, and upon opening it, they're gonna realize that all it is is screenshots out of the TCs. I know where you got. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I was thinking of doing the same thing, where it's just basically intro slides uh, and 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 uh, overall discussion, and then just like <laughs> some random pictures in there, <laughs> like like the ballistic arc over line of sight. And then in the notes section, right? Be sure to read this page and un and understand it fully before you present it to the students. 
Yes. Yes, indeed. That's exactly it. I should do that too. Can I get a copy of that, uh, Paul? <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. it's, it's tech hearing box. It's there. Now with the telephone analogy, I got a funny story about that. I was in, I was like out on a patrol, like been up probably 36, 48 hours. So some insane amount of time everyone had tired as fuck middle of the night and the in ranger file and we the patrol stops and of course everyone takes you know stands there for a second and then word gets passed back and then of course everyone goes in it's like what the hell's going on and by the time it got back to me the word was we're in tennessee and i'm like am i fucking like in a ranger school i'm like Am I fucking hallucinating? Like, what the fuck? Tennessee? Like, how the fuck did we get from North Carolina to Tennessee? The word started off at the front was take a knee. And by the time it got back to us, <laughs> everyone was passing along, we're in Tennessee. And when it comes to that, like, when you posted that shit the other day, Ian, about uh, slide decks and, and dude, you about set me off. I actually, I actually had to stop typing because of the shit. Because I'm doing shit like that right now. I'm I'm actually rewriting a whole fucking course myself and another SF buddy and some other people that are working for us. But you know, shit like critical task lists and then what you're talking about really is instructor norming, or just how oh, shit. What you're talking about really is instructor competence. Um, because I mean, I'm you're talking about in a force versus like a schoolhouse. Uh, where it's schoolhouse, it's a little bit, maybe it's still challenging. It's a little less, but when you're talking about like the whole force or at least a larger force, man, you, you ain't going to, Bubba's going to Bubba. You know what I mean? You ain't, there ain't no, like you said, you can give them the best slide deck in the world. It's all technically, tactically correct. And they'll find a way to fuck that shit up. You'd be amazed at the kind of hate I get when I, when I call people out on either asking for slide decks when I know they're not going to put in the work to validate, improve, and, and, and just rehearse it or know it uh, from, from people. It's just uh, people accuse me of not being a mentor or developing, or I, I get a lot of hate for it. Um, and uh, kind of springboarding off something you just said, um, the, the term that comes to mind is normalization of deviance. So this gradual creep over time where people accept something as slightly out of spec and, and, and initially it's 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 obvious as out of spec but the more it's accepted and, and, and tolerated the more normal it becomes so this normalization of deviance where people just ask for slide decks under the the, the banner uh title of knowledge and management it, it, it's, it's just we uh, Never mind. It's, it's, a, it's a whole flipping rant. Um, the asymmetric warfare group came with a great paper called Leaders as Trainers uh, some years ago, 2011, I think it was even. And every observation in it, it's, it's not a closed hole. It's, it's open distribution. Uh, I might uh, post it somewhere. But um, a, a lot of great observations in there about people. Um, if you can't be, if you can't create your own uh, uh, courseware, your, your own slide deck, your own material, what makes you think that you also have the depth of knowledge to actually be teaching the stuff? And, and it is the basic punchline. And, and a lot of times it's the easy way out of it's, just, I don't know. It's like Scott, it gets me worked up. Sorry guys. That kind of brings yeah. our initial discussion to full circle though too, doesn't it? With, uh, um, you know, one inch minute of angle. Um, you know, there's the learn first, learn better, learn best, or um, teach the lowest common denominator and um, the consequences of that as it plays out. Hey, who's that James Westerfield guy? What's he doing? Who's that guy? <laughs> I'm sorry, who's asking? <laughs> <laughs> The, the token minority, Ian, oh. sorry. Who's James? Who are you, James? Hi. I'm a Colorado law enforcement uh, firearms instructor, late to the conversation, so just listening in, trying to sort out all the acronyms. See, if you went to the training summit, you would have met him. But no. 
So, James, were you at, uh, at were you ever at any one of Fisher's uh, carving courses, practical urban carving, somewhere north of where did I land? What's that little rinky dink Hickville kind of range that Steve Fisher trains out of in in Colorado? Not in Colorado. Great guns. That might be it. I'm not positive. It's out in the middle of nowhere, north in the Flatlands. That, that might be at Ludlow. Oh, yeah. well, that, that, that's everything that's not Denver. Yeah. So. Flew into Denver and it was like an hour and a half north of there, maybe two hours north of there. It was none Colorado. None in Colorado? None. No, none. Yes. N U N N. Oh, <laughs> You're saying it's not in Colorado? Like, what? I'm in Tennessee now? <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, yes, I'm going to start saying um, we're in Tennessee and I'm going to pass that back as the, as the source message. So thank you, Scott. Anyway, nice to meet you. Right on, right on. <laughs> right on. I guess we should, you know what you should title this, this podcast, uh, Matt? This should be called Trigonometry. I was going to say dead a, air. A, AKA weaponized math. You know what would be a fun discussion that would make a lot of people upset? And I think we only really have one qualified person here to talk about it. And it's about the whole TCCC thing and how it's not applicable. I think that'd be fun because it might Let's be talk educational. About that. I want to hear that. That's a great thing. A separate episode on that. If you want to, we can. Yeah, you can do a separate episode on that because you can bring people on that to argue with me. Yeah. Because I think the panel would just listen to nod their heads and go, oh, that makes sense. Okay. That's one thing I love about Gary Hughes and what he's got going on. He's got IFACs that are set up for civilians for all different kinds of walks of life. At, uh, yeah, gunshot wounds aren't the, the primary concern for for most people and it's uh it's cool to see that there's at least one one company out on the market that's um making products that are tailored towards the everyday person so i guess not geared towards penetrating trauma more like blunt more like more like what laceration i, I don't know chainsaw like, wounds yeah hypothermia that kind of stuff I can tell you based on my experience in my area that if you are going to have some immediate first aid stuff, something, something to pack with and some, some sort of tourniquet that's worth half a damn. Uh, Cause the people who I've run across who have actually done any sort of in real life first aid stuff with other people, it's because somebody, falls and breaks a bone uh, off a cliff, off a ladder, something like that. They get into a car wreck. They hurt themselves with a tool. Uh, have I done first aid on gunshot victims? I have, but I'm not doing normal people stuff when that kind of stuff is going on. But I would tell you from other calls that I've responded to assisting EMS and stuff I've run across that uh, it's, People doing stuff with tools, people getting in car wrecks and people falling off stuff is, is, is what I've seen. If you can fix or help stabilize people for those kind of things, then you're pretty well prepared. I think it's pretty fair. And you're, you're unlikely to, very, very unlikely to be involved in a gunfight. Uh, I think even maybe you guys would agree is a lot of law enforcement officers here that it's unlikely, uh, more likely that you're going to come across someone. Yeah. Who's had an accident of some sort. And I don't keep a decompression needle because I'm not trained in using it. Just throw I keep you my I'll figure it out. That's the way I look at it. I'll figure it out. Right. I'm just kidding. I am Do you want to hear my favorite wonder. gunshot wound story? What's your favorite gunshot wound story? So we have a uh, had a Girl Scout. Camp you have to start our... with no shit. There I was. Well, uh, no shit. I got called to this. Okay, there you go. So um, we had a Girl Scout camp in our district, and the caretaker had his own cabin, and we get a 
call of a gun. Somebody got shot. That was the call. So I'm the only one that works this district. It's a mountain district. It's only 1,800 square miles. And uh, I have to figure out where this cabin is. Nothing's well marked. And uh, eventually EMS won't go until I find the cabin. So knocking around empty cabins till I find one. And I hear a guy say, come on in. So I finally go on in and there's a guy on the floor with a wound from his upper thigh down through his calf, a Springfield XD over here, half empty bottle of wine and tombstone is on. Now, you must be Doc Holliday. <laughs> he goes, ah, all right. That's a bit, it, it was more funny to be there, but um, imagining that guy giving his little teacup a spin and putting one through his leg was made my day. I had a guy. And then we got that, to the hospital. Yeah, I had a guy do very similar. It was a single action, uh, forty-five long colt though, that he was doing that, and he was watching cowboy movies. Had to break it out, and he had a little bit to drink. Shot himself in the leg, and he was fine. And he's like, "Yeah, let me put away my guns before you come in." Okay. Yeah, this so guy. Think couldn't. about booze and alcohol, booze and booze and guns. That's the, that's or booze and alcohol. <laughs> See, now, Ian, if you went to our event, just saying. I'll go. September 4th, 5th, and 6th. September morn? Yes, 4th, 5th, and 6th. A lot of good people are going to be there. A lot of good people were there last year. Well, I'm going to check it out. Friends. Um, I'm going to have to jump off, so I'm, I'm saying my goodbyes. But uh, thank no. you for having me again, Matt. Um, Mr. Fisher, there, or sir, you're probably a, a a colonel or something. I don't know. Andrew Fisher, Paul, thank you for everything. I uh, appreciate uh, everything you've done. Scott, um, you make me think too much, so I don't really like you so much. Dave, right on, brother. Uh, that, that's a neat radio you got there. I want one or one that looks like it so I can say I, I do what you do. Um, Cause I too, am an operator of a book that says so. Uh, Darren, nice to meet you. I'm going to check out your gear. Ben, right, thanks. Sorry, James, James is down there. I like that story. This is like romper Doc holiday. I know. Paul and Dugan, Jack Paul. Lewis. Fuck off. Oh, sorry, that was I'm, my mic was on. Sorry. Um, anyway, I'm gonna get going. Thanks so for before you me. go, Have, before oh. you go, you are running some form of a group on uh, Facebook, right? And you know what's happening to these groups that are gun oriented, right? Yeah, I know. So and you know, I, I have think, you know, I have this forum that I can just make these sub forums for you, so you can just go right there and not have to lose your network. Yeah, but then you're the new Zuckerberg. Yeah, Has anyone really. thought of this aspect? No. Matt Zuckerberg. Do we need that in the world? Ooh. I don't know. Matt Zuckerberg. Uh, so yes, this is true. And by the way, I just discovered that my website, my training website, uh, the pages that describe course descriptions. They don't work right now. Don't know why. Hmm. So I got I to gotta troubleshoot this thing. I, I don't know what's happening. It might be some server issue. Or it might be some broader. I don't know. We'll figure it out. But we're living in interesting times, guys. Nice to see everybody. Take care. Stay safe. And um, that's all I got. Adios. We'll see you later. See you, brother. Well... We can still keep going if you want. Yeah, one thing with the medical uh, that I realized I needed. So when I was in the Marine Corps, I went through the initial uh, combat lifesaver program, it, whatever it was. You know, it was fine for, for that time, I guess. Um, I think because of that program, I was trusted uh, with being given two tampons to plug bullet wounds with. Thank God I never had to try that. Whew. Um, but so I thought it was okay generally with using a tourniquet and uh, some quick clot or something on some bloody stuff. And I, I don't know, I can't remember what year it was, probably like eight years ago now. I know I posted that on Light Fighter. Right? So it was probably 2011, 2012. So I see this car roll over in front of me on the highway and I fight traffic to get over. That's the reason I posted about it. Cause it pissed me off how no one had to, no one pulled over for it. And it was like a, a 
log jam of traffic and I'm just like, you're pretty much already stopped. You can't just freaking check to see if they're okay. So I had to fight uh, eventually Mercedes. I was just going to slam into them. I was just like, I ain't stopping. And then started going, they let me over. I had to back up, got to it. I get out and someone had actually had stopped finally. Uh, and by the time I got my wheelchair out and everything, and I like grab my aid bag and stuff like that. I'm like, I'm getting ready to go to work. And I get there and I don't see any, any red stuff. And I'm just like, huh, what do I do? <laughs> you know, I didn't really know what to do. And the guy it actually pulled her out of the vehicle. Um, and so it landed on its side and he crawled into the back and, and pulled her out. Um, because he wasn't sure about what some of the fluids that were leaking on the ground and stuff. But he basically was just kind of holding her hand and I was just essentially doing a blood sweep on her um, without having to roll her over or anything. I didn't see any blood on the ground from her, you know, coming out of her back or whatever. And I'm just kind of looking for red shit because that's really all I knew how to do at the time. And I didn't know how to put on a, a neck brace and just kind of all the more basic stuff that the average citizen, you know, would really benefit from. So that's when I went to uh, Gary Davis's class to learn how to do some more stuff other than just, I mean, that was there too. All the gunshot wound stuff was there too, but I, I asked like a lot of questions on uh, just other stuff, like how to evaluate someone. And um, I didn't even know how to even put anyone into the damn rescue position. Um, and until then, honestly, like I was just like, okay, I can't, I can't believe I didn't know this already because everyone's kind of looking at me like I know what I'm doing, and I'm just like, yeah, it's been a while since I've been in. They didn't teach it back then, so, but yeah, just all that relevant information that you know the average citizen can really benefit from. Uh, I would highly encourage people to to seek out and not just focus on uh, the stuff that is such for us to actually see and be around. I mean, it's it's. I don't want to say it's, I was going to say it's like winning the lottery, but that's a bad analogy. Um, <laughs> finally get to go to put my practice into or practice what I've learned. But no, for us to even be around it is even a, a smaller chance, but to, to be, to hear a gunshot or something else and it happens to someone else and you just, so happen to be in the right place at the right time. I mean, I don't know, both of those are probably like getting struck by lightning. Obviously it happens, but unless you're a, a paramedic or a doctor or uh, a cop who's responding to calls or having people fucked up that are brought to you, you're probably not going to gonna see that kind of trauma. And if it is, it's probably going to be something like someone said earlier about you know, chainsaw or something like that, an accident like that. Well, the sad thing about medical training is people view it as it's, it's not as cool. It's not as sexy. So I don't want to go. It's not, that. it's not. But, it, and, and we it, want to shoot fast and we want to shoot close, but we need to work on those things we're not good at because yeah. when we get to a point of proficiency with those things we're not good at, then maybe we can work on other things. But you know what? Let's, let's, let's focus on the basic stuff that we, we probably are going to need. Am I going to need to draw and, and fire 25 yards and point whatever seconds? The odds are no. The odds are I probably need to know how to apply a tourniquet properly. Is that sexy? No. Is it realistic? Yes. And that's what I need to base my decisions off of. What's realistic? Yep. It's only sexy when you put the word tactical in front of it. A tactical, if I apply the tactical tourniquet. Nice. And then when you put tactical and combat in front of, you know, like casualty care, holy crap. crap. Wow. That's yeah, awesome. Let's not forget about turbo. The turbo... Yes, combat tactical. It's a thin blue line. Or a tactical reload. Oh. Instead of just a you know, reload or magazine exchange. See, we're lucky we don't have uh, Ian here because he'd have to change his pants. So what happens if it's no longer tactical and I change my magazine? Is it no longer a tactical reload? Or is it... I don't think it counts. When does it stop being tactical? It doesn't count. Definitely think that word's been uh, abused too, oh, yeah. way too much. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that, uh, from my perspective, that I've noticed over the last uh, several months with the uptick in new gun owners is the uptick in new gear 
users and owners. And one of the things that I've seen trend wise is that <clears throat> everybody's going tactical Timmy and seeing and you know, keeping up with the Joneses, not realizing, you know, the intent and use of particular platforms and so on. So people tend to fixate on the lowest common denominator in terms of um, equipment types and such. I can't believe the number of requests that I've had for people or from people to make plate carriers. And um, I'm like, well, isn't there a lot of plate carriers already out on the market? Well, it turns out the market's been saturated and folks are buying out all the platforms that they can get their hands on. Um, and not only that, but because of that uh, increase in the number of users, their optics on the availability and types of armor platforms and such are extremely limited. So they think that that's the only thing out there when in actuality for most civilian usages, plate carriers are out of the uh, the spectrum in terms of consideration. You know, there are other platforms that might be more applicable to their needs and all that, but they don't fixate on that because it's first off not in their optics. And secondly, it isn't as sexy. They don't dress up as Navy SEALs and so on. So that's one of the things that I've been encountering here in, in the gear world. And it's been frustrating because these tactical Timmies and all that, they get all pissed off that, you know, it's like I try to push them into the, the way and what they should consider. But, you know, they've already invested multiple thousands of dollars in gear just to sit literally in a closet. Um, I just had one client who um, uh, bought, you know, a series of JPC2s, upgraded uh, cummerbunds, quick release setups using Cobra buckles and all this stuff. He FedExed all that gear to me and then I charged him a couple hundred dollars to basically chop up the uh, the quick release setups and attach it to his cry cummerbunds and then he paid me an extra hundred dollars to ship it back. And I asked him, well, what are you going to do, do with this stuff? And he's like, well, I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but I'm going to stick it in my closet for the time being. It's like, so why are you investing in all this money? You know, it's, it's basically the mindset with gear is that they are wanting to buy uh, the appearance of capability. You know, if they can wear it, then they can use it. And it's frustrating because then it takes away resources that I could apply to uh, satisfying a, um, a request from someone who actually uses this gear for a living. You know, anyway, it's, really, on that. It's, it's really sad, though, because everything you said, someone will be offended by, and they're going to be upset, and they're going to say primary and secondary hates people or is anti-gun or wants to stifle me or whatever. This is the truth. Uh, we do hate people, Matt. Well, we Don't do hate – I do hate, I hate people. But, yeah. okay, what did Pat Rogers used to always say? What, what, drives, the, what drives the gear? It's mission. mission. At what point, even as a cop – uh, okay, I, I wear a soft vest daily. Rifle plates, rarely. Am I going to be in a, in a drawn-out gunfight where I have, I, I'm fighting side by side with other people? These people, uh, a lot of people have this weird idea of, well, the world's ending and zombies are coming and we're going to be fighting and this, they think it's a video game. It's that worst-case scenario that's dramatized on TV and that's their idea of, okay, uh, instead of orienting my shit to what's practical, I'm going to orient it towards the worst case scenario, which is usually the least case scenario yeah. or the least, the least common, the least, uh, uh, probable scenario. Um, yeah. Well, I, I wrote something about the importance of having, I, so I have, I, I have currently one AK. I have a couple more coming. I have a 1301 shotgun, a couple revolvers, uh, a couple 1911s. I have guns that are, they're common, but they aren't using the ammunition that's flying off the shelves as quickly. So my idea behind this was, okay, so I have a stockpile of some 545. I just bought about 4,000 rounds in the last couple of weeks. Um, and I, How much I did you pay for something about that. Uh, about 2,000. 2,000 for 4,000 yeah. rounds? Yeah. Wow, that stuff's going up there. Yeah. Um, and so I posted about that. We're discussing that. And someone said, well, how are you going to carry all that? How am I, what, are you, what are you talking about? Well, you know, this is, this is your end of the world. No, this is, this is training. This is, this is practice and maintenance. This isn't me going and taking over a small country. No, this is just me and my normal, my normal routine. Um, if I go to a class over the summer or whenever, I'll probably be shooting my AK because I want to hold on to my stockpile of 5.56 five, because that's, that's pretty much gold right now. And I'm happy to shoot my AKs. But um, the, the, the fact is, it's, I, I'm a fan of, knowing multiple platforms, being proficient in them, and having the ability to use them all. 
So I have this ammo. I have the ability to train. Who, who else is doing that? Well, I, I imagine the people on this panel have that ability. But when we talk about actual preparedness and thinking a couple steps ahead, the idea of, well, maybe I need to have some ammunition before I need it just seems to be lost on people. And the minute you bring it up, oh, yeah, this is for end of the world stuff. <laughs> no. I think the problem we're facing here, Matt, is that folks tend not to think on multiple levels in terms of capabilities, needs, missions, and so on. For your average Joe citizen, you know, it's like you're not going to be fighting the zombie hordes. So why are you preparing for that? Well, because it's the easiest for us to visualize, right? We don't want to spend the time to slice and dice what our mission, so quote unquote, would be. What are the most likely events that we are going to encounter? You know, kind of stepping back to what Paul mentioned about, you know, coming up on this car wreck. Um, you know, you would be uh, probably more in that situation of coming across an accident on the road than you would ever be in a gunfight. So, you know, it's like, well, you, you train for those types of contingencies and all that because you've identified that as a potentiality. Now that you've actually experienced it, that is definitely a mission requirement, you know, to know, hey, how do I respond to a roadside accident and such? You know, what are what are our needs? What are our, you know, meet, succeeds and so on. Um, so it, it's just one of those things where folks just have not given the time to really uh, dig in and understand what the requirements are and what they truly would experience. And then what do they have in terms of their skill sets and capabilities that would allow for them to meet those goals? Anything that's shortcoming and all that would be something that needs to be addressed in order to make sure that you can resolve situations as they occur. Um, that being said, um, Whenever I bring this up to folks, especially in other conversations, it's it's unreal that, but basically nine times out of ten, they were going to respond angrily at this. Like I'm calling into question their yes. their their planning, and it's like, no, I'm trying to, uh, you know, light up the path here for you to understand that there are multiple ways and things that you have to consider in order to be quote unquote prepared. And what you've done is basically just barely scratched the surface. But I don't know if it's an issue with folks just calling it quits because it's the easy thing to do to the extent that they're planning to or trying to uh, account for multiple uh, contingencies is a very difficult thing to actually, you know, keep in mind. So I don't know. Well, you know I think it goes back to when the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Yep. Oh, yeah, and definitely. And one of the things I was thinking about, and I, I, I've watched your page. You post a lot of like historical uh, pieces of kit from time to time yep. and and uh and, and i think you know we're we think along the same lines is there's really not a lot of new or in a, you know uh Dear innovation in, innovative ideas there might just be something that's a, an improvement upon something that existed or even just an exact almost you know reproduction of something just better or different materials and mm -hmm. i see a lot of you know again people are copying or and i i went through this i think everyone who's probably been even law enforcement officers when you think about when you first started doing what you do you carried and you thought there were certain things or pieces of kit that were important to you and you probably had more shit on you than you needed and like at least i can speak for myself as again like mission drives everything but i remembered i like i look back at some of the you know, older pictures of myself where i had a bunch of shit on myself and i realized you because you don't have the experiences that you do later on down the line you don't necessarily know what you do and don't need and what that mission is you know going to be so the answer to that is if i got if i got molly space on my my armor i'm gonna put a pocket or something there that i can put something i think that i might need in case i need it whereas as i've moved along in my career i've realized that Hey, there are certain things I know that I need, or there, there'll be another mm -hmm. place where I can get them. And my kit has gotten streamlined, and it oh, also yeah. depends on what I'm doing. So I've like, you know, you see some guys, and it's like, hey, you got like a bare bones set up, and you got just like, why has that guy only got, you know, three max? I'm like, well, you know, guess what? Well, during a a DA mission to direct assault, I might, you know, I probably might only have to shoot three or four times, and if I'm going through three mags, uh, things have gotten bad. But I've also got a whole ODA of dudes with me with, you know, I have support. I don't have to carry 50 more pounds of shit on myself 
if I, you know, what it, if the mission dictates. Now, if I need to be out there for a while or something, yeah, I'd, I'd, pl I'd plus up. But people default to more is better. That's what I think. And you see people buying, like you said, plate carriers and things that they don't necessarily need. It's just they've seen that that's what, mm -hmm. well, this is supposed to be the solution. And I'm supposed to put a bunch of shit on myself just in case. Right. It, because they don't know what just in case is or what their mission is and what it is they're doing. Because quite honestly, a lot of times, you know, and this goes back to like what you know, Matt will see in there is like, well, hey, I work in a place where I can't uh, carry or it's not. You know, it wouldn't be well received. Again, what, you know, I'm not saying you shouldn't defend yourself or be prepared, but again, what's your mission? What's, you know, what's more important there on the priorities? Like, and what can you do and identify those? Because I go to some extremely dangerous places and certain times I, and I can't have the, you know, the, the things that most people would default to. I have to find and, or, or use things that are, readily accessible to me uh, in, in the environment that I find myself in. And they're not necessarily be my choice, but I realized that my mission is fits within these parameters. I need to tailor what it is and where I'm at, my environment, to fit that. Otherwise, um, you know, you, you just can't be like, well, guess I'm going to die. You know, no, there's always should be some critical thinking there is how else could I do this without having to carry everything in the kitchen sink on my on my kit or on my person uh, or you know loaded up in in four different contico boxes yeah in exactly the back of my truck yeah i mean but you, you hit on a good point there in that it is context and i i believe that everybody on this panel will have a greater amount of context from which to make these decisions these folks that are new to the the space now they don't have the context, so they don't know what they don't know, and they can't make the appropriate planning uh, decisions in order to accommodate for whatever particular contingencies that they might uh, encounter. Uh, because it, again, it comes back to you know you're going to have to come up and deal with some hard truths, uh, you know, going forward. You know, is this something that you need to take care of? You know, sometimes they consider, you know, we're, we're thinking about equipping myself, but what about what if I have a family? How do I contend with them? you know, and, and things of that nature. So as a result, you know, we, we come up with this uh, state where folks just cannot plan accordingly. So they're going to default to, I'm going to take somebody else's context and use it as my own. You know, one of the things I, I see a lot of is people saying, hey, I just bought this chest rig or whatever. Let me see pictures of your guys' setups so I can get ideas on how to configure mine. It's like, well, it's one thing to see just pictures of gear and all that. It's another thing to entirely understand the context in which that gear is set towards and relating it to what your particular space is. And if you don't consider that, um, you know, how do you know whether or not that's something that is applicable to you? It seems like a lot of these, <laughs> these people, a lot of people that are doing this, uh, the, the thing that's lacking is that, that, that simple frame of reference. Exactly. And how do you gain that frame of reference? Experience. If you can't get that experience, you need to find a good person or a good group of people or a good source that provides their own frames of reference that you can take notes from. For me personally, Pat Rogers was an awesome frame of reference to determine which way to go on a lot of stuff. <laughs> Took a lot of training with that guy. Learned a lot. Primary and secondary. There's a lot of inspiration from Pat. Mm -hmm. And the way I run this thing, the way I run the forum, a lot of inspiration from Pat. The way I want to see AARs, it was Pat's method. Um, but because of him, because of the after action reports he posted, that gave me an idea of, okay, I like this. This makes sense. Unfortunately, yeah. we have people that want to be spoon fed everything and they can't do this on their own. They can't go out and, and seek out frames of references to build their own um, perspectives. We yeah. just I, were dealing with that in a low information group where someone was listing off all these YouTube channels and they're entertainment channels. They're not educational right. channels. And they're well, saying, yeah, hitting, you need to go here. No, you, you don't. Go ahead. You're hitting on a good point there, Matt. When we went through this, um, you know, the last Pat Rogers class I took was in 09 here in Colorado. Um, what's missing in this particular uh, point in time? You know, that is now readily accessible by everybody on their cell phones, social media, right? 
social media has done a lot of disservice to our society, I believe, in that it acts as a veritable magnifying glass to various topics and such to make them much larger than they really are. But the flip side is, is that it provides a lot of accessibility to information that was previously close hold or you needed to know whoever in order to get to. The problem with that is like it's the relevancy of that information that you have access to. You know, how many different iterations do you need to see of a particular, you know, 556 based, you know, M4, uh, you know, as a defensive, you know, carbine? Um, you know, everybody and everybody's going to have their take on it. Um, I don't need to see that. I need to be able to burn through all the noise in order to get to whoever's providing the right signal, if you will. And unfortunately, a good majority of these consumers lack that ability to burn through all the noise in order to find the true gems of information. And unfortunately, I think um, because of that, the, the relevancy of information that exists now that are really valuable for uh, end users is still to the same degree as it was, you know, 10, 12 years ago. It's just now that people have all these additional layers of fluff that they need to burn through in order to, you know, ex access that stuff. And then to that point, those folks that have tried to seek that information out, do they have the dedication to really, you know, vet it and, and understand it and apply that to their situation? That's where I think some of the, the issue lies is whether or not they're willing to go forth. And I think this kind of stems back to the discussion a couple hours ago when we're talking about, you know, MOAs and, and what have you um, and our responsibilities as, as instructors. You know, if we understand our customer base and we direct our, you know, POIs to that customer base, then as instructors, we've developed, you know, the contingencies that you know, folks will encounter. So we can teach to those contingencies. And as long as we cover the base of, uh, of issues that they can uh, potentially un, uh, encounter, that's the extent of our you know, responsibility as an instructor. The onus then transfers over to the student or the person seeking the knowledge to apply you know, those lessons and those points of information to satisfy some situation that they're encountering. And I think that going back to your low information uh, you know, society comment, you know, I think there's a, a, a general lack of want to proceed on learning information. You know, we just want to get some blurb and that's yes. it. We've yes. encountered that. We don't want to delve into it any further. Well, it's just like talking to those people that say, well, you know, I only take training from people who are special operation forces veterans. Well, why? How does that apply to concealed carry? Well, no, that's, this is what I do because this is, because this is the best. You know who they train with? They train with Tim Heron. They train with competitors. Maybe these are the people you need to train with. No, no, no. Because they've been shot at. Why does that matter? And it's, it's another aspect of them trying to, they're, they're trying to go beyond this, the, the learning for themselves. And they're trying to, trying to go for what they think is the meat and the potatoes of the subject. But that's not. They're they're trying to skip that sort or skip the uh, the step of creating your own frame of reference. Yeah, I trying saw to use that someone else. Today. Yeah, that, that, he was that was half baked logic. He was basically saying, you know, what I took from it, I just breezed it. Was go to qualified and vetted people, and that's what he considered qualified and vetted. But he he totally you know disregarded everything you just said, and again that goes back to you know you can't be a little bit pregnant you know you're either right or you're wrong in, in the way you present something so um yeah i mean it, it, it's a it's an uphill it's pushing a snowball uphill in hell yeah well you know and, I, I've, and i'm right there next to you yeah well and and i've i've been a student and i've been an assistant instructor at darcy i don't know how many times um the last time i went through we were doing explosive breaching Counterterrorism, hostage rescue, all this has no bearing on everyday carry. So if there's someone that's a master at that, I'm not going to go to that person to learn how to draw faster. I'm not going to go to that person for my, to how to improve my everyday carry. But for some reason, a lot of people seem to think, well, clearly because they're doing this high speed stuff, 
They have the answer to everything. That's not the way the world works. So Scott, you, uh, you, you mentioned special forces and you, with you being one of them special forces guys, you guys have a very unique mission that's kind of different from traditional forces. And it requires some, some unique skill sets. Yeah, and that's true. I mean, you can look at, uh, I mean, you're not wrong, but at the same time, like we, we do have, even have our own, we didn't, and this is again, just like we talked about earlier, we used to go to the, the people that do this, but we have our own internal where we teach uh, concealed carry. Uh, and we've actually, you know, developed our own, you know, based off of talking to the right people, the smart people that do this. And we, because we do work in a lot of environments where we are in civilian clothes and we are concealed carrying in, in no shit, really dangerous places. Yep. Um, although I, I can honestly say I've walked around in some really dangerous places and felt safer than I have in places like Chicago and other places. Uh, in the states, but the bottom line is, is that there are certain people within the in the, the special operations community that, yeah, we do train on specifically on civilian clothes, concealed carry, so you can get some good pieces. And a good, like a good example, good friend of mine, Mike Green. Um, well, Mike Green, yeah, we started, uh, you know, working on on the pistol POIs and all that way back in the day, and then that became uh, another. Uh, topic that we had to, you know, had to jump on, and Mike came up with a fantastic concealed carry course. Um, and of course, he he did his due diligence, and we went out to the the, the SMEs, the people that were doing this, and developed a package for it. Um, you look at guys like, you know, my another one of my good buddies, uh, uh, Mike Panone. You no, know, yeah, he's got you know a laundry list just like Mike and I do of, of accomplishments, but he also worked federal air marshal. And you think he, and you know, you think he knows something about concealed carry? obviously um and it's just accumulation of those skills and abilities along the way but um but to think that every uh you know that that should be the only you know the way that one individual was posting about to think that that's the only way to to validate or to make sure that you're you're training with the the right person for your mission is is it's flawed logic and i think um you know that's part of it. that. You know that guy was tr going in the right direction, but he he didn't figure for you know declination. He's on the right. He's as 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 this right, but he's forgot the declination angle. So he's a few degrees off of where he's going. So he's going in the right direction, trying to get vetted and qualified sources of instruction. But his logic was for for doing that and was a little skewed, in my opinion. I think in yours too, because he got shut down pretty quick. It was fun. I mean, yes, it was very educational. But yeah, that yeah, that is something we do. But again, just like anything else, I always give credit to, you know, people that taught me stuff or I learned something from it. And within our community, yeah, we went out to we reached out to outside sources or other people that had experience doing this before we developed what worked for us in our environment and and ran with it. Um and Mike's Mike's courses and you know, same with uh, you know, Mike Court Mike Green's course with uh, concealed carry is excellent course. Mike Pannone is excellent as well. And uh, even, you know, Mike teaches a limited penetration, uh, you know, household defense course. That's, it's well worth, uh, you know, people that it fits the mission of what someone here would have, not a, a team of dudes going in doing a CQB type mission. It's, it's based upon, you know, home defense. Um, so it, again, it goes back to the mission and is that person, you know, necessarily the right person to go to. It depends. You're, and that's why you have to do your research and, and come into sources, vet, you know, people that you know that are that provide good information, uh, that are high information, low noise, um, is where if you're not sure, you can find that information out without having to weed through the noise. If only there were places that focused on that kind of thing. Or people that knew what they were talking about. Or people that, yeah. It's all Dave's fault. I think. Hey, you're the one that insists I need to hang around. So. Well, I think like what we were saying before, you know, like you're talking like earlier, the example of mail and MOA, it's like. If obviously there's going to be groups of people that 
you're in a class and you don't know who all is going to be in that class and they're, they're all going to have different motivations. But if somebody is digging it and they're seeking it out, which you can probably give that higher, you know, you can kind of take them into deeper waters with it. But I was just thinking even like what Darren was saying, like, I wonder how many people are actually issued a JPC versus the, all the dudes who went out and bought one. And then how does that somehow kind of get into the mix where there's, you got to give people what they want, especially if they're paying for it. And like, how does that like kind of backfeed into like a weird loop of, 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 uh, where you're like, okay, so what, what is the real concern here? What is the actual thing? Cause it's like, you know, there's all the people that actually are issued a firearm and use a firearm for, you know, use it for work. And then there's like the, all the millions of other cats that don't. And they, they're obviously like a larger base, you know, these companies are in it to make money. So like, how did, how does that inform shit? You know, cause even in like, you know, the, the gear person at the police in the police department is not usually a gear person. They're the ones that are like assigned. They've become, the, you know, like the person who's like doing, like making the purchase for your armor is usually the, also the same person that like is the Porter's uniform pens. guy. And he's not, yeah. He's not really like into, and then in the military, it's the same thing. Like the, the, the people who are making the decisions, they should be people that, should be end users that are informing that decision. So I was just wondering about, cause it's like talking about like the zombie apocalypse, probably buying a gun and, and getting your zombie load out is probably about the easiest thing you could do too. So not only is it like a narrow focus of this thing that I'm not gonna do, it's almost mildly lazy. Cause you're just like, ah, well, I got the gun part. I feel, I feel better. You know, I've got my safety blanket here. So I was kind of wondering, like, of the tactical oh, there's that word. band camp culture. Well, yeah. I mean, if, you, if, if you're going to do the tactical band camp, you know, space camp, space camp culture where, you know, all these guys are buying JPCs. All these guys are buying plates. All these guys are buying multi-cam everything. You know, how does that right or wrong kind of back feet some way into the real shit well, it's, in my it's, experience it's, and it's funny can you mention because and darren can relate to this i'm sure because he has um, you just gave it a good example jpc again it goes but it's mission should drive you know what you decide to use jpc what do you think the j stands for in that acronym jumpable jumpable <laughs> so it was made for and I Okay, so it was a, it was it was specifically designed for people that you know you could jump it uh, versus you know basically a full carrier and and, and so again obviously it, it's meant to be fairly light and it wasn't meant to be like a full uh, you know armored set of armored vest that's why it's basically what it the way it looks it does and the first thing people do that probably don't do this job you know or don't wear one of those for the job. Uh, is try to put a regular carrier's worth of shit on it. You know, they, they, they start adding more and more to the cummerbund side and on the fronts and the back. And it was meant to be something that was light and you could jump with and you could take, you know, the bare minimum of what you needed to, to do the job. Uh, whereas when they really want is something is a full on armor carrier. The problem is, is, is it's a vicious cycle in what you're, in what you're asking here, Jack, is that it, it, there's a, it went from being training to being entertainment, you know, the band camp. And, and it's, you know, if you're going to, that's one of the reasons why, like I said, you know, if you're going to be in the training side of this world, um, you can do what you do and, and, and how you do it, but everyone's got trying to get an angle. That's why we got like fucking all these buzzwords and shit that people made up you know, basically telling you how to tie your shoes is they're trying to set themselves apart from the crowd and there it's marketing. And so if we all say, you know what, you don't need to be dressed in multicam to go out there and learn how to shoot that pistol. But 
if some dudes are, are wanting to do that and there's a dude that goes hey man i got like a bunch of people asking me if they can come out and i can teach them how to fucking you know do ninja rolls there's then there's going to be dudes that are going to start teaching some ninja rolls i mean just look at the industry and look at the courses and and the, what is being taught it's a vicious circle um as long as people want it people are going to there's going to be someone that's going to be there that's going to train them like is it in their mission to do uh, small unit tactics you know and and in their livelihood? Probably not. Um, are they ever going to have to do hostage rescue uh, or a, a direct action mission with a, a full fire team of people? And when, you know, it's just them and their family. Probably not. But it's so there's an entertainment portion to this, I think. And I also, like you said, it's the easy solution than to thinking through the critical process of what is my mission? What do I really know, need to know how to do to do? my mission keep whether that's keep my family safe keep my family and my house safe uh keep myself safe while i'm out in public or while i'm at work or while i'm traveling whatever they're, they're doing is identifying what those um missions are and then realizing that they're all gonna there's no one solution for all of them there might be times where your solution for at the house or while you're out working on the on the farm is is not going to be what you can use when you go into the courthouse or into town somewhere or someplace where you can't carry the things that you want to carry so you have different missions you should have different equipment that fits those missions and use or wear them when they're when it's applicable and most of the stuff you see people running around in unfortunately is you know uh, it's not really applicable. Like, okay, so you got a plate carrier. Do you carry that with you everywhere? Is it like in, you know, you running around with a bag in, in the back seat? And you're like, oh, plate carrier time. You're going to throw that on? I mean, that's kind of that, you know, fantasy masturbation fucking, I'm going to, you know, sheepdog, mole on lobby or whatever, the, you know, Spartan it up. Mandalorian. Mandalorian is a new. I, I came up with something. I thought of something the other day, Matt. Uh, so, Molan Lobby, Spartans, and Vikings, Valhalla, all that stuff's out. That's all like, you know, behind. Punishers. The, Punisher, yeah, way. That's even older. That's all old. The new stuff is Mandalorian. This is the way. Yeah, everything's going to be now Mandalorian. So, stop using the Vikings and, and all that guy. That's the. I don't know if you got the memo or not, but saw it on the internet. But that's the whole thing. Is it? it it's it's become kind of a, a self. It's self an image. Eat. Yeah, it's a self-looking ice cream cone. To you know, to answer your question, Jack, is it? It kind of creates itself because people want to do this stuff, and then people are going to teach it. But you know, I mean, how many people really need a set of nods? I do. Gear comes at a cost too. I mean, the upkeep yeah. of it. If you want it to work, that's time out of your everyday there, there's this this rhetoric due to the political climate that uh is popping back up that um the largest standing army in the world is an Ameri is the american hunter um american hunters don't have communication systems or logistics they have to feed themselves they have to shelter themselves they don't have the support that an army has and uh you know this idea that your plates are a priority over food and water when the guys who are wearing plates are, you know, have five ton trucks backing them up with food and water and ammunition. You know, how much surface area of your body does do plates cover? And, uh, you know, what priority should that be for the average, um, you know, uh, militiaman, as, you know, Mike Lewis differentiates us by. Um, so, so, you know, that, that, that 10 pounds could probably be put to something more practical, like something that's going to prevent you from freezing to death or starving to death or, you know, things that are more likely to kill you than being shot in this general area right here. Well, and in, including that, the money that, that, that's, that you're spending on, that could go to training, that can go to ammo, that can go to useful things. The odds of you actually needing plates, that's less than the odds of you needing a gun, I would imagine. And that's and the, already kind of low. The, the costs of, of getting all doped up with gear is a loss in mobility and a loss in, you know, increased fatigue. And um, this idea of, of militia, militia, these men that 
um, fought in a regular war and won, um, they didn't win it by out armoring the em- enemy or, or having more ammunition and, and more volume of fire than the enemy. They won it by out maneuvering the enemy and, uh, you know, looking like the militia man or the, the Michelin man when you leave your house is not conducive to success in that regard. And in, to the extent where I've seen people, you know, actually kind of pair their EDC stuff down to more realistic stuff. The other side of that I've seen is that, okay, so now I've got all like, honestly good common sense items to have but they all want them they want to all be able to put them on their waist i have to have fucking everything on my waist i gotta have my gun i gotta have my tourniquet i gotta have all my medical i gotta have reloads i gotta have my knife i got you know i'm like at some point you look like batman and there but of course i can't print i can't fucking print i need to figure out i need to, you know you're buying clothes that are five times too big for you or you're you're trying to figure like, Hey, what point do you think that, you know, you're, you're actually going to need all of that. And if it is, then do you have to have it uh, like on your body? And if the answer is no, then, you know, obviously you're trying to, again, you're, 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 you're trying to figure out a you know, fantastical situation where you, you, you imagine where you might need it all. If you, but if I can carry half of that stuff in the briefcase or the backpack or, it, it sits next to me because it's, I'm always there instead of trying to strap it all into my body. What makes more sense? And I think a lot of people are starting to, for, you know, have forgotten quite about that. It's like, I just want to get as much as I can now on myself. And of course I can't print. It has to be low right. profile and uh, low viz. Again, what, how much do you need? What's the mission? Um, Cause I can tell you, like I said, I take a lot of stuff sometimes where I realize that, it doesn't make sense for me to have all this stuff on my body, but I definitely need it. And the biggest one being medical. So I have, and I usually have either like a backpack or some sort of carrying device, um, or it's near me. Like I know, Hey, I'm going to be working pretty much in a vehicle or in and around this vehicle. It'll be in the vehicle where I have access to it. Um, instead of trying to jam all this shit on my body. And that seems to be the big thing again is dress for success. You know, mission should drive what your your loadout is, or how you load out. And well, you know, also too, I was talking to I was talking to Chuck about this because you know people were talking about you know the, all the unrest that was occurring in the past year. Um, you know where you shit did happen and people did find themselves like, you know, they went outside their house and they're like, oh fuck. Um, but there's, like you said, with a lot of those things, it's like people trying to keep all that stuff on their person and trying to be low vis about it or what what they approximate as low vis. But it's just that there's a lot of that stuff too, especially when you're carrying it, you still skyline yourself anyway. Like just in uh, any, anybody with a knife. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Anybody with a knife, like that manage. pocket, that that pocket clip right there, that's just. Even if you manage to to maintain your concealability, your anonymity, uh, you still sacrifice mobility by having a bunch of shit on you. You know, you reduce your your range of motion, and you're right. increasing your weight, and you have to carry that shit, and uh, that in- increases your fatigue. It it it, uh, right. it you know. There, there's a cost to gear and um you know so yeah. unless you're going to be able to especially, maximize the utility of the gear you're... that's on you it's it's counterproductive so you know learn how to use it use it to its full potential otherwise you know consider the costs of carrying it of having it on you right and it, and just like the way that what matt said it's like you know when you have I don't know, like I said, so like, say you have your pistol, your knife, your reload, your tourniquet, your light, all that shit. And just like, just like Scott was saying, it's all on your belt line somewhere in your pockets, or maybe you got something in your ankle somewhere. And if you don't think you carry yourself different when you're packing all that shit, you're wrong. 
And if you don't think that you're not uh, doing these little micro adjustments all the time, you know, moving all that shit around and all that stuff, and like you said, just just carrying yourself. And if and if you're, uh, you know, if you <laughs> you walk outside your house and all of a sudden you find that you you're living in the Chaz, and you're thinking you're gonna Alamo up instead of just straight getting the fuck out of there. You know, it's like I said, I think it's just uh, it's good points, and, and a lot of that is like a, pri- a a priority thing, like where you're just like, what? Okay, what are you really gonna do? Are you really gonna do that, or are you just gonna get the fuck out of there? And you can tell everybody later on. I mean, you can lie to everybody later on, like, yeah, man, bought my way out, or you can just sneak the fuck out because nobody gives a shit about you. Step one is to be honest and realistic about what you're going to do and base your equipment off that. Right. And it's not like this, like you mentioned unrest, and that's like, it's a good point. It's the thing is, is it's not like this, this sporadically unannounced happened. Every, I mean, if you're in an area or you know you're going in an area where this type of shit could or is happening. Well, then that goes back to preparation. If I, like, if I know I'm going to get into a, fi- a firefight, well, then I'm going to stack the odds in my favor. That's, that's, you know, rules of combat, three to one, the whole nine yards, planning, met T. But the bottom line is, is if that's what you, if that's your reality or that's what you're, you know, like there's a very likely possibility that could happen. It's a concern. Well, then take those items with you. And obviously they don't all have to be on you. They just have to be within arm's reach, right? Or close, you know, in the trunk, in the behind the seat next to you. Um, so you have access to them. That makes sense. Uh, you can't take everything with you all the time. You can't take it all with you. You know what I mean? You got to figure out when, when and where do I need to apply this and how can I make it to where it's not, or I, I look like a tactical Timmy or a paranoid freak. You know what I mean? So if you, I mean, if you know you live in an area like that or work in an area like that, well then by all means, figure out a plan that works to fit your mission. Like, like I said, it's not like all of a sudden, like like you said, you're not gonna just like walk out in your door and someone's gonna be like, like you know, like the old Pink Panther, Kato is not gonna be like, ah, I'm gonna attack you out of the blue like that. Like as soon as you walk out your front no, door. It's gonna be a helicopter lands in, in, in your front yard and you gotta go, come on, we gotta go save the something. Yeah, the president called. So I was going to say the president, qualified. but I don't know. Yeah. With everything that's going on right now, I don't want to screw things up. It's all Jack's fault. Yeah, it probably is. It is. Hey, but think about, like, think about it even just from a law enforcement <laughs> aspect of it. You get a call to a certain area, you know what are the good areas are, the bad areas are, and what the likelihood is something happening or kicking off are, don't you? I mean, you kind of have like a preconceived, you know your terrain, you know your the environments, or you know the type of call. You might even know who, who you're, you're going to, a house you've been to before, or a place you've been to before, and you know what to kind of expect, or at least you have a, a, you're predispositioned to have an idea of what it is. And what do you do? You, you prepare yourself mentally, and then you also think about, well, okay, well, fuck, I probably might need, you know, I might need my plates on this one. Let me stop before I even head over there and put them in the seat next to me or put them on or, or maybe I get more mags, whatever that is, you, whatever pr- critical thought process you go through to, to do that, you prep beforehand, right? I mean, you just don't go, like show up and go, well, hey guys, sorry for ruining your Black Panther party, right? I mean, there's yeah. some critical thought that goes into this before you do that. And I'm sure before you even walk out of the house, you, uh, you, you carry that. Didn't you get one of those cool bags, Matt? Like those patrol bag, patrol officer bags that sit in the seat next to you. Did you get one of those, or was that with someone else on PNS? I have a couple of them, and they're in the bed of my truck. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, you thought about like shit that you might need during any time during the day, depending on a certain situation, and you got a bag for it. Yeah, and you you probably take it in and out of the house, or change things in and out of it as needed. No. Yeah, got got five bags with different things for different missions. Pretty much. Yeah. That's how we all are. But still, at the end of the day, you've put some thought processes into this and, and yeah. you've come up with at least courses of action. It may not be the, you know, this 100% solution, but at least you know, I know this is what I need and how I need to either increase or decrease what it is I take with me. And that's, we all have to do that. 
not just a cop thing. It's not just yeah. a soldier thing. It's uh, an everyday firearms carrier guy. Well, if I'm just going to be at my house all day, am I going to be carrying the whole bat belt? Eh, not likely. That's, st- that's also another step. That's helping you determine, okay, what, what, what's my threat profile here? Am I going to carry a gun? Good possibility. Even if I'm in the house, sure. Where do home invasions occur? They're not on the street. They're your house at home. Home invasion. Get it? Yeah. It, it's, it's, uh, in the, it's in the title. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But yeah, yeah. Work off that. Figure out, hey, where are you going to go? What are you going to do? What's your mission? So who, who am I with is a determining factor as to what my mission is going to be. If I have my three-month-old son with me, and it's just the two of us, I'm not going to go save Nakatomi Plaza. No. Though he would do great, he would be a great like baby Yoda and put him in the, in the pocket or something and go and fight. And, no. It's amazing how fast kids change your mindset in that regard. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, how long would it take to on a plate carrier in a home invasion scenario? I, yes, absolutely. <laughs> That's one of my favorite questions there. Well, it's I can for, grab the kid or I can the put on the plate carrier. Yeah. Which one is it going to be? Both. The kid is in the plate carrier. The okay. Baby plate carrier. Does the baby go in front of the plate or does the plate go in front of the baby? That's the question. Uh, side plate. Uh, side baby. But what what picture was that in one of, in one of those uh, gun ads where it's like the chicks like holding the kid, but it was just like, like so. All kinds of them. Yeah, it's Jaren, you make you make a, a small baby plate carrier, don't you? Yes, he does. I, I've got do. I've got one, dude. I bought one. That's why I was like, I, I have one that I bought from you, dude. And I have had it on my as a joke because you came out with those a couple years ago, didn't you? Yeah, I, I made my first one back in 2011, actually, and uh, or 2012, and I've made them here and there for folks who requested them. Uh, I just made one up here a couple months ago. It was a full-on uh, reproduction of like a Marine Corps MTV. And it came equipped with a little removable chest rig and, and so on. So chest rig was basically half scale to my uh, uh, regular uh, chest rig. So the magazine pockets you know, all accepted, you know, fun size Snickers bars and, and so on. So. Yep, I I, I uh, got one of those. I have your work. I appreciate your work. That reminds Thanks. me. Where the hell did I put it? I yeah, Matt sure. posted a directly applicable photo this week. There it is. Okay, let's see here. Share screen. There you go. You guys see that? Yeah, <laughs> kid's gonna be buff. He's not even walking yet or crawling. No, those are from my plate carrier, not for him. Ah, okay. Well, I, I did make a baby-sized PC that was shaped for I think extra small sappy. So I think I was Rob Winner's kid, nice. uh, Space that uh, got that way back one in the day. Wait a minute, was that for Jace? For Jace, no. Um, yeah, Jace Winter. Wow, that what, that was a long time ago. Yes, it was a long time ago. Jace yeah. is like 30 now. <laughs> sure seems like it. Great. No, but I mean, all told, I, I think, yeah, as you mentioned earlier, Scott, the, the gear world is just kind of recycling ideas and, and so on. And unfortunately, we had just have... The, the demand is being fed by folks who just don't know. And unfortunately, those people typically aren't in circles that can you know, get them out of uh, that mindset and such. In fact, I would say that uh, the circles that they're typically found in would reinforce their need to have the gear that they chose, as opposed to refining what their requirements are. Um, so I guess the good thing is, is that uh, for the foreseeable future, uh, the quote unquote, uh, uh, contingency uh, industry and all that will be well in business uh, from these folks. I've noticed this branding phenomenon where um, the latest and greatest hype that people jump on um, 
once everybody's on the same train and the product is no longer easily accessible and it's kind of um, not unique anymore, there grows this um, counterculture that comes out of it. So um, there's like a, a, a soft gear companies that uh, have become famous for making uh, small product drops that people hoard and then sell on the internet two weeks later for five times as much and yes. the, the yeah yeah and and the original customer Bad. base grows gets disdain like they grow disdain for this this company that originally they were the ones that were hyping and uh yeah spiritus is a, a perfect contemporary example but there are many many more um and uh yeah so and as soon as uh, Favor dies out with Spiritus, you know, somebody's going to bring it back again. And yeah. Yeah. That or, you know, you have companies that basically linchpin on top of existing gear companies to add accessories and such. And some of these accessories are well-founded, you know, upgrades to JPCs and stuff like that. But, you know, it's like, are, do they have standalone gear that, you know, they can exist outside of, um, uh, another company's products and, and so on or better yet companies that dupe designs that you've put out and thus uh, they might come up with a different design element but customers may confuse what they offer with what your product offerings are and it's 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 a evil vicious circle let's just put it that way and i, I tell you when it came out to uh, uh, creating the very first vocr chest rig that i did back in 2011 2012 time frame you know, I basically concocted that uh, out of like a 36 hour design exercise to satisfy um, a request from some Kiowa pilots out in Iraq. Um, so basically, uh, if for the folks that are listening in who are, may not be familiar, the Kiowa is the OH-58 observation helicopter. And the, the, the kicker is, is that it's a very small form factor helicopter, very tight spaces and all that. Um, but uh, pilots would often have M4s in the cabins to take pot shots at targets of opportunity. Well, the problem was is at the time, the gear that the pilots had for their survival and extraction and all that didn't allow them the ability to have magazine reloads at the ready. So I had um, a client contact me to create something that could be worn underneath uh, the extraction harness yet not interfere with the operation of that such and also the operation of the control. So that's where the, the VOCR came about, which is short for vehicle operator chest rig. Uh, it's now been since reclassified as variable objective because it turned out a lot of folks kind of like that idea and they wanted to do it for different things. Um, but that said, you know, it's just a contextual uh, repurposing of gear is something that I feel a lot of folks still lack the ability to comprehend, um, you know, in, in case in point, you know, like the bat belt uh, notion that you mentioned, I see a lot of people wanting to do uh, gear around their waist and such. One of the things I see a lot of is the fact that they pack on all this weight, but they never consider putting uh, suspenders on their bat belt assemblies because, you know, they're going to ride all that on their hips and such. And it's just, uh, again, uh, bring that up to somebody who's doing that. And they're like, they look at me as I've got a green dildo sticking out of my head. You know, it's just uh, trying to bring some common sense into their line of thinking and chances are you're going to get your hand fit. Yeah. I know when you say that, I'm thinking, uh, uh, that's a ding. And our, was it Arctic? You know, some of those early, like, 1980s type low-vis vests and stuff like that. Uh, you start, I know exactly what you're talking about because the biggest thing I remember, there used to be a place called the Outpost in, in Bragg, and a guy named uh, Willie used to work there. And he was the guy, he was the dude who did all the, the, this was before nylon sewing stuff was, like, as hot as it was. I and mean, this guy was the only show in town and uh this was right about the time when um lbt and i think e, it was lbt came on at first the, you know basically the wider shoulder strap or shoulder pads like on an lbe like a suspender lbe came out you know what that was like what late 80s early 90s and uh running you know that type of like all that stuff around your waist and being able to add something like that 
with the suspenders, it made a whole different, it was a whole different ballgame. I mean, anyone who's carried an old school LBE that was loaded down knows how much of a pain in the ass just having stuff around your waist it can be. Suspenders helps relieve some of that if you set it up right. Um, and like you said, you post a lot of the old stuff and you can just see the evolution in gear. It just, it kind of gets recycled. It's like, this is, you know, this is just a, a, a material change or something that didn't exist when this first came out. Like, you know, Cobra buckles, uh, uh, shit, Fastex buckles. You know, what was, you know, what, does everyone remember what, it, you know, how great the world was when Fastex buckles came out? Like, if you remember before Fastex buckles, you're like, what the fuck? And when Fastex buckles came out, it was like, I was astronaut shit, man. I was like, wow, I can just click this thing and click it out. Um, shit like that, you see a lot of, and you post a lot of really good old pictures about it, like that stuff. And, and it, I like that because because there's a lot of people out there now that just don't know or don't take the time. Again, they have the whole world at their fingertips on a, on a, cute, on a computer or a phone, but they don't take the time to actually look into it. Um, and you people only realize like, yeah, this is a recycled idea. Yeah. Or there's nothing original about it. Um, I mean, Matt, probably, I don't know if the rest of you guys are in on the chat, but I found uh, an article on uh, an old clamshell holster. Did you read that, Matt? Did you read that article? Mm -hmm. I posted it no. in the I posted it in the in a chat in the PNS chat. For like the, an for old moderate. So yeah, it's basically it's a it's a clamshell holster, but it uses a, a button. Which, in the trigger guard. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah Scott Reitz has a really really cool video about that. All right, so I posted an article on it. That shit dates back to like, I think if I read that, I remember the article like the 30s. And it basically gets yeah. a clamshell holster. But yeah. if you think of a Safari Land holster with the hood, it's that concept where you have to push a button down, but it's spring loaded and it, it, it literally clamshells open. Yep. And it was all made of leather, it has a piece of steel in there. But again, it had the same flaw that Serpa holsters had. So again, it just goes, and it had this, if you read the article, it, it talks about the same problems with people having NDs. Um, because it requires you to put your finger in actually the trigger guard in front of the trigger to push this hidden button, which is behind the leather, that caused the clamshell to open up. Yep. Uh, I mean, again, it was just like you could see someone had gone through the, you know, the thought process. They just didn't have the, you know, the materials or the, you know, the, 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 uh, you know, honestly, technology to, to help them build what they thought, but. Again, that was basically a spring-loaded holster, you know, a hooded holster, a version of it. And we've got, you know, uh, obviously something that someone came up with. It's been reproduced, but obviously it's gotten better. But if you didn't know that stuff, you'd never know it even existed. Yeah. Like, like that. there was some shit like that. Someone thought about that in the 30s, about protecting a gun from being taken from out of your holster from you or from it falling out inadvertently. Um, I should, I was like, you know, that that's that's history, and then you go look back at that, and you'll find shit, and that you're like, man, someone actually thought about this, and we just through, you know, time forget about it. Well, I there's mean, something to be said about knowing history. Something about destined to repeat it or something. It something, yeah, I don't know. I, I know my my one tip for people listening or watching right now, don't get your gear advice from fitness models that don't know how to even hold a gun. There you go. That's that's coming to you live from Matt at primaryandsecondary.com. And that, that could be male or female. Yes. Uh, for some reason, though, guys really listen to the female ones that they, they – you probably have no business giving any advice. I don't know why. Or can't fit into a plate carrier. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I went out and got my tactical Corona bikini when all of this pandemic stuff went down. Yes. Tactical. Well, we have been on for over four hours. That's not a record by any means. But I think I need to go check on that three month old who's wearing my plates right now. If you guys would like, I can keep this rolling though.
Your call? No, Open I'm mic. good. I mean, J- James keeps talking and, you know, yeah. can't get a word in edgewise. <laughs> I'm burning a pizza watching. right now. I got to get going myself. <laughs> So with that in mind, let's get some final thoughts, if you have any. Uh, Also, if you have anything you want to share where people can find you or things that you think people should look into, um, kind of get your promotions out of the way. Andy, are you still here? You are here. Oh, you're muted. Ah, I got to do that to you now. Uh, I didn't talk. I didn't say anything. (laughs) uh, What was the question? Your final thoughts. And uh, anything you want to plug where people can find you, any of that kind of stuff? Uh, you can find me at Trauma Daddy on Instagram and at St. Fisher Church of Evidence-Based Medicine. And on the Primary and Secondary Forum. There you go. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, let's uh, figure out when we can have that TCCC discussion. I think that would yeah. be really cool. Yeah, let's do it. Cool. James, I think he's going to plug staccato. Matthew? Yeah? You think I am? Yeah. Not, not, not yet. Okay. Not yet. Things are coming. Things are coming. So I'll stick to my normal line of obey the law. <laughs> there you go. That's right. Because it's the law. But wait, you're not on duty. You don't have to say that. It's still a good idea. Okay. It went, until it's not. We'll just leave it at that. Um, that's about it right now. Enjoy being able to come and say hi to everybody and talk so damn much over all the Ben. Um, the only thing that comes to mind, uh, really is a very prophetic, uh, primary and secondary episode, uh, about, um, atypical self-defense options that is uh, really becoming um, it was really really applies to modern times so uh, I'm going to go rewatch that again and that if I remember right speaking of long primary and secondary episodes that was a pretty long one but uh, well worth it yeah those primary and secondary modcasts they have some really good panels Really good, educated people sharing some good views. Not this one, though. Definitely not. No. Jack? He muted himself. I bet he's talking right now, and it's muted. How about now? You're good. I don't know. I just uh, kind of hope everybody shows the fuck out. And because uh, whether people are, I'm just encountering a lot of, just out in daily life, I'm just encountering a lot of tension. And then, so I just kind of need everybody to chill the fuck out for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, because. Things can kind of, you might, we might have like a, things can flash whether in, in anywhere where, whether people think it or not. And, um, yeah, just, just chill out. <laughs> so Try if, he, if uh, AT uh, had something to say about this, what would he say? Oh, about the same thing. It's, it's hard. Cause it's like recently it's, it's just, it's been hard to, it's been hard to feel funny lately. <laughs> it's just, it's been hard to feel funny or or feel appropriate making jokes about shit when um, I don't know, maybe for some people it is, but it's just for me, it's just been difficult where I'm like, man, what the, what the hell what the hell are we going to say about this? Well, I think it's because unlike other people that you feel and understand the gravity of everything that's going on. Right. You know, I think, you know, when everybody, uh, you know, I still got people, you know, I, I don't know if any, any of the other cops are, are feeling this. I still got people coming up to me, telling me, or I don't know if with, whether they really believe it or I don't know if they're just saying it. But, you know, I got people talking about, like, uh, 
y'all were so scared. We, you know, we were terrified. Like we had this guy that was telling me how he was terrified of me when he was literally a Chewbacca. <laughs> He's literally a Chewbacca. And I was like, man, I just need you to talk to me for a minute. And that's it. And he was, ba- he was telling me, he's like, you know, him and his girlfriend, like, look at like cop police brutality, police shooting videos all day. And I'm like, well, yeah, I would be pretty upset. I said, but if you use that same Google machine to see when any of the cops around here shot anybody, I think you're going to be okay. Yeah. And so again, it's like on either side of it, I, I would like people just to chill the fuck out. For a little bit. Well, you know, the media is not helping with that. And they're not, portraying not things very, very inaccurately. Not at all. I have. A, I also have. A, you know, after the, after the twentieth, because uh, I don't know if anybody heard about that guy that went full uh, Grand Theft Auto in Chicago. Nope. Nobody heard about that guy. No. Yeah, that no, was like a several hour event. They, uh, I think he it started in Chicago. I want to say it. It ended in however many municipalities over but strangely enough it didn't fit the narrative of the active shooter anti-gun thing at the moment i have a feeling probably after the 20th that's going to kick up again but um you know it's like you said perfect example the media framing that you know previously that that would have been something that would have been a full news cycle for a week nothing was mentioned so, like I said, it's kind of whole, kind of want everybody to mind their p's and q's, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Any plugs? Hey, plugs? Uh, obey the law. Obey the law. If if you want to, uh, if you want to see some of these trials and tribulations about worrying about getting killed in the street, you can go talk to a guy named Ambrosia Terrible. And as far as what I'm plugging, uh, it's in the works. One thing that I'm probably going to end up plugging and just uh, Walter and Sons of Liberty Gun Works. Cool. Right now. It's, it's, they're literally, that's, uh, the, the Sons Gun's actually my duty gun right now. Oh, those are good plugs. Yeah. Okay. Dave? I never have anything interesting to say. DNA guns. Yeah. Yeah. If you like, uh, if you want to, if you want to do the fun movie gun thing and waste lots of money, uh, turning, turning ammunition into noise, we can do that. Look up DNA guns for as long as we'll be on social media and then also DNA guns.com, but also for primary and secondary, the forum, we have a discord server. We decided last night to make a public channel. I have a feeling we're going to regret that again, but we'll see. Yeah, we will. And I will say from the uh, from the from the cop side of things, I have for for the people I talk to, uh, whether it's in an enforcement capacity or not, I'm I'm at I'm at about fifty fifty right now, where people will say, "Hey, thanks for what you do," versus the reaction will be, "I have been foon sped that you're about to." you know, like stomp on my neck with your boot and then shoot me eight times and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, we can't, we can't let communication break down. Like just talk to people. Don't lose your mind. It's not going to help. And with that, I'm going to jump off cause I have to go to work. Uh, well, yeah. it's work if that's possible. Yeah, we'll see. Some days it is. Some days it's not. Be safe. Stay right. safe. And Darren? Uh, no really parting thoughts for anybody, really, or anybody out there listening. Um, you can reach me at uh, Instagram.com slash Extreme Gear Labs. Um, if I was going to say one bit of advice, though, just be smart about your gear choices. Think it through. And, uh, you know, Instagram is not reality. <laughs> it's true. Scott? Um, I'd have to say, it's like anything, vet, question why, ask the hows and the whys, uh, if you truly want to understand something, 
Uh, and if you're an instructor or someone who provides information to someone, and try to be able to answer hows and whys if someone asks them to you. Um, so with vetted, you know, use vetted and qualified sources for training and information. And that extends beyond just, uh, you know, the shooting community, uh, especially in this time and age. Is, uh, look at, you know, I know passing up articles and memes and I got a friend and so-and-so, all these things that get repeated on social media. Uh, trust but verify you know quality you know step away sometimes honestly it's best just to step away from the the idiot box you know the computer whatever and uh don't get caught in that vicious cycle a lot of people are caught in the vicious cycle right now and they're in echo chambers they're you know they ever you know people feel that unrest and that tension and they're clinging to groups and whether it's on social media or otherwise and they're listening to a lot of the same you know, uh, fear mongering, um, you know, some of it's valid, some of it isn't, some of it's disinformation. You got to step away from that. You got to actually kind of you approach it with a critical eye, even if it does fit your agenda or your narrative. Uh, just because it, it, you think some of it's right, you got to be able to see where maybe there's some disinformation or just some outright wrong information or fear mongering. So vet and question everything. Understand the hows and the whys. Um, not just in shooting, but also kind of what's going on now. It's just, that's what I think a lot of people are just, they're so caught up in, in what's going on that they, you know, you, hey, what's going on with you? And they, they don't have anything else to talk about because they've devoted so much of their day and their time and energy to, you know, worrying about stupid shit. The shit that's going on, they have no control over. Yeah. Uh, you know, we can worry about and influence the things that you can control as much as possible in your environment, in your life. And then, uh, do the best that you can to stay sane. Um, as far as plugs, I'd say uh, check out Green Mike Green at Green Ops. He's doing some great things. Um, Psionics weapon systems, excellent weapons. I uh, highly recommend them. Uh, you know, they, they provide parts for a lot of some of the other people out there that make some really excellent weapons as well. Uh, I know everyone's flooded right now as far as looking for, for gun parts and ammo. It's drying up. So um, with that said, um, don't accept mediocrity. Don't accept, you know, low budget. Start putting low budget items into your, 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 uh, your gear or into what you carry. Um, and I know a lot of people have uh, had some issues with Signal. There is an alternative out there. It's end to end. I put it in PNS chat, but it, I'll put it out there for everyone else. On the a iTunes App Store, it's called Council C O U N C I L. It's an end to end encrypted uh, application, very much like Signal. Uh, not as robust as far as like video, but as far as uh, you don't need a, a phone number to to register it. You just need an email. Well, you do you can use a register a phone number or an email, so you can use a burner email. Um, but it's, uh, you can create your own usernames and you can burn different net, we call them networks. So it's basically, you know, like a, a large chat room, you can send pictures and stuff like that. Um, but it's, uh, it's called bring your own key encryption. So you, you know, as a, if you create a group mat, like just like you do for zoom here, you create a, uh, you know, the, the, the room and then there's obviously a, a system that we have to you know put your passcode to get in there's a passphrase and that basically builds upon it's a lot like if you ever use pgp encryption there's an asymmetric asymmetric encryption going on there and uh you have to know the user's name so i'd have to know whatever you know your group's username is and then you'd have to know that passphrase that would allow you in and it's in encrypted as soon as you're done you can burn that chat or that network and it's gone and it's all encrypted um even if they like they did like the someone came on and just you know got the servers like they did with parlor or whatever they, all they would have was encrypted data yeah there was nothing that's uh, going to be left out there it's, and it's it's free and right now it's free they have it for android and i don't think they posted this, a link to it yet but there is an android one that's coming out i think the google store is you know it's waiting to get processed or whatever but it is for android and uh, for iphone cool just an alternative in case signal stops working for some people or any of your other apps. 
And definitely now is the time to establish those, those uh, secondary plans, those backup plans, because it seems that Facebook doesn't like certain, a certain demographic and they don't want a certain demographic of groups. So people are being removed, groups are being removed, pages are being removed, access as admins is being removed. So there are groups or pages that don't have admins. Uh, certain people can't even post anywhere. So establish those networks now. Primary and secondary has a uh, backup network. It's at primaryandsecondary.com slash forum. If you're not already there, please log in. Please create an account. This is a way to stay in contact because as soon as Facebook's gone for us, you know, we can't predict when it's going to happen. We're going to be, well, there kind of goes a lot of our networks and a lot of our connectivity. And uh, one way for us to stay strong is to stay connected. So if all of a sudden the things that keep us together is gone and we have no other way to, to maintain that contact, well, we just got weakened considerably. So check out that form. If you happen to have a Facebook group or a page or a business or anything that is gun gear, any of the training related, go to the, go to our, go to our uh, forum. Can't talk. And I'm happy to, to help you create something there to, at least maintain a presence so you can stay connected to the rest of the community. Um, that's the goal. I want to keep the community strong. I want to keep us all, all connected because if we're not, how the hell do we share ideas? How else do we grow? How else do we learn from each other? So big thanks to our sponsors. Big thanks to Filster Holsters. Big thanks to Staccato. Big thanks to Walther. Big thanks to the Patreon subscriber. If you go to patreon.com slash primary and secondary you can help support the network there are benefits associated with the support there are various tiers of support um, starting at one dollar monthly we have uh, all kinds of resources for you and pretty much all the resources that i offer are free you don't need to do anything to gain access but this patreon thing gives you an opportunity to pay back um, and by no means is it mandatory but yeah please use that form. As Dave said earlier, we do have Discord. If you want access, send me a message. I'm happy to help you out. Um, Discord access opens up greatly, though, if you happen to be a Patreon subscriber. We have a lot of channels in there. Right now, we only have like three for non-Patreon people. Um, as I normally say, make sure you are supporting those sources that you have found to be beneficial. If you like what these guys have to say that we're on tonight or on other podcasts, or even people that aren't associated with primary and secondary, make sure you're following them. Make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you're sharing and liking. Hell, make sure you're liking, sharing, and subscribing to primary and secondary because that stuff is currency. Um, there are all kinds of bad sources of information out there that are giving you all this feel-good info, but it doesn't make you better, and it doesn't make you think. It's kind of sad. And it's, you know, it's fun to have that entertainment. But it's also important to stay grounded and to, to focus on, on your own betterment. So make sure you're giving all those likes to all the good guys. Um, our training summit is in September. We have an all-star cast of instructors. If you go to primaryandsecondary.com, on the left-hand side of the screen is a menu. The bottom, the bottom part of that is talking about the, uh, the summit. Click on it, find out who's coming out. There are a couple more instructors they're gonna be teaching. Um, those haven't been officially announced yet. We're working out some bugs and some details. But it's exciting. Last year was outstanding. We had so much fun together. There was some great, uh, great instruction, great people. Uh, it was a great, it's a great community. It's, it's wonderful to be part of this. So not sure what we're going to talk about next week, but it's, it's good to be back. Good to be doing these on a regular basis. This week, uh, episode six of the original episode six modcast will be released I think it's like three hours long, four hours long. Uh, old school stuff. Our audio sucks. Bear in mind, we have dead air, but the conversations are so much fun. And it's interesting to, to track the progress. It's interesting to hear what these guys have to say and to look at where we are now and see how much of this stuff was accurate and how much, how, and see, there really isn't that much that is too far off. So again, though, audio sucks. We, we've definitely improved. Um, so that's it. Thanks for listening or watching. I will talk to you guys later.
Okay. I'm going to go. It, Matt. I have a five hour hamburger right here that I haven't touched. Because this has been going for, I've, I've had this recording for four hours and 44 minutes. I think it's time to eat dinner. I you guys you, take priority. You. Ah, oh, shucks. Aw. Uh -huh. <laughs>